Okay, so today is the, the, the 2nd of June, 2022, and it is also the birthday of Carlos Carpa. He was born in 1906 on this very day, the 2nd of June. So let's read a little bit. He died at 72, a little bit older than 72, 72 and a few months under curious circumstances. So Carlos Carpa, uh, was an Italian architect influenced by the materials, landscape, and the history of Venetian, uh, Venetian culture and by Japan. Uh, it seems he died in Japan, actually. Scarpa translated his interest in history, regionalism, invention, the techniques of the artist and craftsman into ingenious glass and furniture design. Well, this is what I read uh, on Wikipedia. Scarpa was born in Venice. What a chance. Much of his early childhood was spent in Vicenza, though, where his family relocated when he was two years old. After his mother's death, when he was 13, he moved with his father and brother back to Venice. Carlo attended the Academy of Fine Arts, where he focused on architectural studies. Graduated from the Academia, Academia, the, Acad Acad the Academy, Academia in Venice with the title of Professor of Architecture. I didn't know that, you know, one graduates from a university uh, with such a title, Professor of Architecture. Maybe in Italy, this means something different from uh, other places. He apprenticed with the architect Francesco Rinaldo. Scarpa, opportunistic as most architects are, married Rinaldo's niece, Nini Lazzari, Honorina Lazzari. Nice. That's how one makes it into the world and through the world, by marrying, you know, the niece of your employer. Uh, however, however, and this is important, Scarpa refused to sit the pro forma professional exam administrated by the Italian government after World War II. As a consequence, he was not permitted to practice architecture without associating himself with an, uh, with an architect. <laughs> you know, with an architect as if he was anything else. Hence, those who worked with him, his clients, associates, craftspersons, call him professor rather than architect. <laughs> I mean, uh, life is strange, isn't it? His architecture is deeply sensitive to the changes of time, from seasons to history, rooted in a sensuous material imagination. He was Mario Botta's thesis advisor, along with Giuseppe Mazzariol. The latter was the director of the Fondazione Querini Stampalia when, when Scarpa completed his renovation and garden for that institution. Scarpa taught drawing and interior decoration I told you why, at the Instituto Universitario di Architectura di Venezia, which is apparently the only university of architecture in Italy from the late 1940s until his death. While most of his built work is located in the Veneto, he made designs of landscapes, gardens, and buildings for other regions of Italy, as well as Canada, the United States, Saudi Arabia, France, and Switzerland. His name has 11 letters, and this is used repeatedly in his architecture. Nice. Verum ipsum factum. These words, these three words in Latin are incised on the, on the, at the gate, uh, you know, to the entrance uh, to the University of Architecture. Now, of course, Italy has many other schools of architecture. But I was told only one university of architecture, and that is in Venice, where he taught. He taught decoration. And uh, what, did, what else did he, did he teach? Uh, drawing, because, because he didn't have that thing, whatever the, the Italian government uh, asked, him to, uh, asked him to have, and he didn't. Uh, the Institute of, um, uh, well, I don't know, it's, I, I don't think I translate correctly, but it's the University of Architecture in Venice, Entrance Venice, and we are going to see where these words, um, you know, belong to this part of this design. He, he designed this entrance into the School of Architecture, 
And he incised there, I mean, not with his own hand, I imagine, and although that would have been nice too, verum ipsum factum. From what I understood, this means truth through the, through making, through, through yes, truth through making. And, and, and I think this is a deep um, call to arms, so to speak, for architects. You discover truth in the act of making. Um, he was uh, very, very uh, peculiar in his uh, usage of paper. He didn't use uh, any paper with any pencil. He had to match the right pencil for the right paper. So he loved paper. He loved to draw. He was a, an incredible uh, uh, sensualist in, the, in terms of drawing. And we are going to see many of his drawings. He used to place, um, you know, he worked a lot with tracing paper, yellow tracing paper, placing one uh, paper above another, above another, above another, above another, and so on. Uh, many years ago, when I attended a conference by Kenneth Frampton on Carlos Carpa, which, which he called uh, the adoration of the joint, Carlos Carpa and the adoration of the joint, then I went home and I, I wrote a uh, you know, my, uh, I don't know how to call it, an article, an essay exactly about this. And um, uh, I think I called it the details, the detail which knows. And if any one of you is interested to read it, I can send it to you. Uh, I mentioned a lot there Lao Tzu or Lao Tse, the great Chinese mystic, because I think there is a relationship between Carlos Carpa although he was fond of Japan, but there is something in his architecture that um, connects him also to, in general, to Oriental wisdom and, and Lao Tzu or Lao Tse uh, is, um, I think uh, could be very relevant to understanding um, uh, Carlos Carpa. Uh, the details indeed, you know, the details, the so-called details uh, in his architecture are uh, formidable. You know, they are creations in themselves, audacious. And it only shows that actually in architecture, there are no details. I mean, I call them details, but, but they are, uh, <laughs> they, they, they don't adequately uh, connect with this word or are described to this word. I mean, this is almost like a, a small, uh, you know, sculptural abstract work, uh, almost, uh, uh, you know, uh, significant in itself. It performs a function, but you see this man designed everything. I mean, but, but, but in a very unpredictable way, you know, everything, even the placing of the you know, of the, I always have a trouble to maybe because I dislike shurubur and uh, I, I remember the word nail, but not the word, uh, the screws, I guess. Yes. That where the screws, I mean, look how, 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 you know, he, he, he positioned everything perfectly and to generate uh, a, a, an ornamental uh, effect. Are we doing the same thing in our work? Well, it's very difficult because we, we build, uh, you know, uh, large complexes of buildings. No one has time, so to speak, to do something like this. But a uh, good architect who cares about everything, the smallest part of the building, thinks and does things, I guess, I hope, similarly to, similar to, to Carlos Carpa. This is the view of the entrance. Uh, into the campus of the uh, of the University of Architecture, and uh, what can I say? You know, he he created an event, an architectural event uh, of a function which uh, most people would have treated differently. It's uh, it's uh, it, 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 this is this is another example of uh, creativity in architecture. You know, he, he could have uh, mimicked, uh, you know, a banal interest or maybe less banal, but less, well, even idiosyncratic. This is a, 
probably if you spend some time in front of this interest and study everything and look at things and even you know uh, uh, go uh, through and back and through and back you, you, you might uh, even write a philo short philosophical uh, poem this is profound architecture but it's also joyous and playful it's it's um, I don't know how to convey more than the work itself that we look at the, the beauty of architecture when it is assumed as a little adventure. It doesn't have to be a large adventure in terms of dimensions. You know, you can you can create architecture in a, when I wrote uh, that um, text on him, I said, you know, uh, uh, a square inch for Carlos Scarpa is enough to create architecture. Um, there is a saying in China that uh, in a second, there are thousands of years. And similarly, talking about space, we could, we could say that uh, in a square inch for Carlos Scarpa, I exaggerate a little bit, but uh, symbolically, I, I think uh, I might not be totally wrong. In a square inch, in a work by Carlos Scarpa, there are thousands of uh, square miles or square kilometers or whatever. Um, I think we need more architects like him in the world. You know, instead of having uh, absurd dreams to going to Mars, maybe we should consider the, the, the beauty of the Earth and the, and the value of every square inch that we have. Unfortunately, it's easier to think about traveling for six or eight months in the darkness of cosmos to go to a place you could never return from in order to concentrate on the beauty of the earth and take care of every square inch. Here he is, smoking, of course. Like a, like a man possessed, well, you know, uh, I, I think uh, creators in any field are uh, complicated beings, you know, they, they, they burn within and then, you know, some of them smoke, some of them drink, some of them uh, become uh, virtuous, like monks, you know, as uh, Charles Baudelaire said, you know, uh, get drunk with uh, virtue, poetry, uh, or, uh, or wine. It's up to you, you know. He was, he was, he was even eccentric in like you. You see on his, uh, I don't know how it is called this finger on his left hand. He had a rather feminine and flamboyant. Um, I cannot call it diamond because I don't know if it was. Let's call it a jewel, but uh, very unusual for a man, uh, you know, in the seventies or so, sixties, seventies, eighties. No, no, because he died in 1978 um, in Europe. No, I, I, I mean, in the 20th century, who would wear this kind of uh, ring? I mean, I'm sure some centuries ago, they were common, but not in the 20th century. I don't know of any other modern architect sporting such a, such a ring. <laughs> but, but Scarpa was unusual in many ways. Uh, I like this picture of him, really. It's, uh, it looks a little bit like a famous uh, soccer player today playing for Internazionale Milano or uh, uh, one of those teams. Um, <laughs> I don't know if you would have been pleased, but you see he uh, hearing this. But he is here with a craftsman. So what do we, what do we see here? He is actually helping the craftsman and we see here uh, the craftsman on the right and the artist on the left. The artist being, of course, uh, Carlos Carpa, the, ar the artist. And again, I remember what Walter Gropius said. They are both rooted in craft, both the craftsman and the artist. The only difference is that the artist, in this case, Carlos Carpa, is exalted. Yes, exalted. And I keep asking myself and others and students, are we exalted? Do we work with exaltation? Well, 
it seems certain professors are against exaltation and against enthusiasm. They think uh, the, the student needs less enthusiasm, not more, certainly not exaltation for God's sake. And indeed, how could you respond to those restrictive rules and regulations being exalted? You couldn't. I like Carlos Caipa, I really do. I'm sure he was uh, complex, difficult, uh, fluid, uh, uh, exotic. Uh, I mean, uh, again, look at his ring and look at his glasses. Uh, there is a picture, I hope I have it here. The fact that architects have a hard time to, to find a decent pair of uh, eyeglasses, I know. But he, he himself, couldn't make up his mind about uh, the eyeglasses and he, he was using at one point uh, some very strange eyeglasses. I hope I have a picture uh, of him uh, to illustrate this. I like this Italian, I really do. I don't know, I mean, should I continue? Because I become emotional now. We need people like him in the world. We need people interesting, uh, complicated, uh, absurd sometimes, ridiculous other times, but who create beautiful things. <laughs> the professor, he couldn't be called architect. Can you imagine? You know, he was the quintessential architect, you know, in, in, you know, in the second half of the 20th century and he couldn't be called architect because the government, the government, its majesty, the government, here he is. Now look at these eye, uh, eyeglasses. I mean, really, if she was some kind of a, if she was some kind of a prima donna in Hollywood, you would have said, I don't know. But uh, I mean, I mean, what architect would, would use such eyeglasses, really? And you tell me, he was a serious man, a philosophical man, a mystic in a way. But look what eyeglasses he was, uh, the frames, they are incredible. I would never wear something like this, even if I got paid for doing it. No, never. And I can be ridiculous myself, but in my own terms, not with this kind of eyeglasses, no. Well, we could also comment a little bit on the hat, but the hat is not so outrageous as the eyeglasses. Here he's dressed, uh, you know, uh, like a Japanese, you know, he's, <laughs> He's, a, he's an actor, you know, uh, having a good time in some way in Japan. He died even in Japan. He, falling from a building, I read, or falling from on the stair uh, mysteriously, either descending from the plane or in a building. It's very unclear. I did some research. I didn't obtain a PhD in how Carlos Carpa died, but I did, I did investigate a little bit and there are various, um, uh, you know, uh, stories related to this. Drawings. Now we arrive at uh, what he was excellent at, truly excellent. I mean, uh, well, this picture is not truly really doing justice to his genius in drawing. Maybe this one, but it's a little bit too, too pale also. Um, I don't know. I mean, Again, if you would show such a drawing in a school of architecture, in certain schools of architecture, you would be dismissed or like this, you know, because it's not uh, technical enough, precise enough, although it's actually very precise. I mean, you know, you could say anything about uh, Carlos Carpa, but that he was not very, very, very minute, he was. But the drawing is poetical. It's, 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 it's a quest in colors with uh, pencils uh, sharpened appropriately. And as I said before, he wouldn't work with any paper for any pencil or vice versa, with any pencil or any paper. No, he had to have the right pencil for the right paper. Otherwise he, otherwise he couldn't draw. I love the fanaticism of this idiosyncrasy. Uh, look at here, what's going on here? These are studies for a house, uh, but uh, is, was this man mad? I mean, uh, what's going on here? Too many, you know, little fragments scattered everywhere. 
this man was certainly uh, something. He was a dissenter. Uh, you know, he had problems. I love Scarpa. Uh, and look here. I mean, I can talk all evening and maybe even overnight just about contemplating these two columns and what's going on here, meeting the horizontal part of the structure. I think it's beautiful. This is a life love poem. This is a love poem in architectural terms. Right here, we have, uh, we have two beings, no? two columns. They are together, but they are also uh, individualized. You know, you can acknowledge them uh, in their individuality. And then there are, you know, there are connections in the crucial parts of the building, the slab at the bottom, the beams at the top. You see there are transitional elements. The column doesn't, doesn't reach for the beam just, uh, you know, just to arrive at it. There is always a, a third element, this transitional element. The same here, there is always a third. And this third is negotiating between the two entities. Here again, this is, this is, this is art, this is poetry. You know, it's, 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 this is totally lost today. Totally lost, I mean, I don't know of another architect who has indeed this understanding and longing for uh, for for uh, for um, the, you know the truth and the beauty of joining, as Scarpa did. Uh, of course, in ancient cultures, uh, you know, good uh, craftsmen and architects were not at all indifferent to the art of joining. That's why in Japan, for example, you know, true craftsmen didn't even use nails forget about screws. They, they just joined elements without, uh, you know, raping them with what he tried to do here. Because, you know, uh, BRK Ingers, for example, he, of course, he would not have used two columns. Because in this case, you could very well just put one column, maybe thicker, maybe not, and, uh, you know, to support, to support uh, the same thing. But but Scarpa was interested in, uh, in two-ness, T-W-O-N-E-S-S. -S. And, and he understood that an entity is not, is itself, but is also the, the container of a, of a double, of a duality. And, and these dualities are of an erotic nature. You know, I mean, eros here is not presented literally but is presented up in an abstract manner and, and, and symbolically, metaphorically. We see even here the same thing. We see uh, a negotiating third that connects this part with this part. And we can see it all the time in his work. This man was uh, digging deep into the mysteries of life, into the mysteries of creation, and that's why you know, his work is very, very important and very, very relevant. Relevant to, to everything, not just to architecture, to everything, uh, to culture, to art, to humanism, to, to everything, really. Uh, he was a maker, of course, verum ipsum factum. He was concerned with, with doing, with, with, with creating, architecture that is buildable and built. But beyond this, he was, he was a poet and, uh, and uh, extravagant, eccentric, yes, yes, without the title of an architect, but who cared? He left about, you know, he left behind a legacy which is his. You cannot confound, you know, his drawings with anybody else's, nor his buildings. Again, look here, the smallest thing, you know, it's, 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 you are for the gods, actually, you know, like the ancient um, uh, builders of the Hindu temples, and probably not only Hindu, who devoted themselves the most to unseen parts of the building, I mean, unseen by the human eye, unseen by the tourist, and so on, but seen by God or by the gods. They work for the gods, 
they didn't work for the flash cameras. They didn't work for the magazines. They didn't work for uh, you know uh, mainstream uh, publicity. They work for God or for the gods. And uh, in those temples that I mentioned, apparently the most beautiful, the most accomplished parts of the temple are actually a vertical dialogue, a dialogue between the architects and the crafts and anonymous as they were uh, with, uh, with the above or the below, but not with the humans. Um, Maybe we should relearn that, that, that longing that other, other civilizations or other cultures or other times had with the unseen, with the beyond or the below, with the above or the below. Uh, uh, we desacralized everything, you know. Yes, we still build churches in nonsensical ways, especially in Romania. Uh, and we still claim we are believers, but we are not. We don't have faith. And this is shown in our works mainly. Uh, we saw this one, uh, we didn't see this one, but we see in most of the drawings scattered fragments, 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 fragments. It's as if this man was afraid of, the, of a center, you know? And that's why when I wrote about him, I refer to Lao Tzu because for Lao Tzu, uh, water was immensely important. And uh, the, the fluidities of Carlos Carpa's architecture are very different from the total fluidity or the fluid totality of Zaha Hadid. No, it's almost the opposite. He could work with the straight lines and still achieve fluidity, a different kind of fluidity, not an explicit fluidity, an implicit fluidity. But what Lao Tzu said about water is magnificent because actually his uh, Dao, the Dao of life, his uh, very little book, very small book with 80 sayings, he is saying that water, which appears to be weak, is actually very strong. In fact, it's stronger than the strongest rock because in time, water can erode the biggest and the strongest rock. And he is entirely true. So, you know, uh, water appears to have no center, you know, it's uh, continuously moving, it's uh, apparently avoiding the big uh, stones, but in time eroding them. In the same way, the drawings by Carlos Carpa seem not to have a center, but the center is unseen, not seen, was within him. He was gravitating around that center, which does not appear explicitly in his work. Um, very interesting architect. Um, I wish I had one of these drawings. I, I, I would have, uh, I would have gladly uh, put it on the wall and look at, looked at it. But we can have uh, prints these days. Of course, we can print anything. Again, I look at this drawing and I see the beauty of practicing architecture. A beauty often we lost lost sight of. In our quest for, uh, you know, uh, respecting the rules and regulations or pleasing I don't know whom, we forgot to be ourselves, to be true to ourselves and to create poetry through architecture. And this is what architecture is supposed to do. And we don't do it. And uh, look at this uh, nervous line here. <laughs> I'm sure, I think he was also a temperamental man. Well, he was Italian after all, but here I see some angst in the way he, you know, uh, uh, as Jean Nouvel would say, l'intuition crayonante, the, uh, the intuition which, um, I forgot the word in English, but you understand, l'intuition crayonante, uh, there, there is uh, nervousness, almost impatience. Maybe I idealize him. Maybe he was not so, uh, you know, extraterrestrial as I try to depict him now. It's possible. Maybe I, I talk about an imaginary Carlos Carpa who is in my head or in my heart or in both. It's possible. But, uh, you know, this is always the case actually with heroes. You know, the, the true heroes, I mean, uh, in, in real life, they might be different from what we imagine they are. 
but they inspire that imaginary uh, uh, hero that is in one's head or heart or both. And for this is enough to, to you know, uh, yeah, uh, idealize them, I guess. Anyway, let's not become too poetical here. Let's come down to earth. But I like, you know, his drawings are, they even seem to be awkward or unskillful even sometimes. You know, th this kind of sketch, which is done, of course, for, uh, you know, for his own uh, studying a certain problem and not to impress a client or a professor like him, uh, he, he show, uh, show a man with hesitations, with questioning. There are more questions actually than answers in his drawings. And that's exactly what I like. You know, I, I was talking in my article about him, about this, that there are uh, little ziggurats in his uh, architecture, uh, which play hide and seek with each other. It's again about the eros of life. It's about the dualities that try to become one and they, they, they do come one, they, they do become one temporarily and the, temporarily and then they again they distance uh, themselves from each other. It's, it's the tango of life, it's the tango of eros, it's the tango of, of, of yeah, of, 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 of of, of the cosmic attraction and rejection. And, and uh, it, it's, it, it's, this is what creation is to be. Residences, let's start with his residences. Casa Veriti, Udine, 1955, 1961, by this professor who couldn't be called an architect because he refused to pass a certain exam, examination. This is, this, it makes me smile because this is about that disobedient architecture that I am, uh, you know, trying to promote. Yes, the architect is a disobedient uh, being, intellectual, artist, you name it. Yes, disobedient. Okay, I, I don't feel like doing something. I don't want to make a certain compromise. I love architecture. I, I give my life for architecture. But I refuse to take a certain exam, which would humiliate me. So please forgive me. I will uh, just look at my ring. My ring uh, tells uh, something about who I am. And my ring uh, told me uh, last evening uh, I shouldn't take the examination. And he didn't. Casa Veriti. Here it is. I think it's excellent. <laughs> you know, it's. Uh, Kenneth Frampton said that uh, uh, Carlos Scarpa made immense effort, an immense effort to remain within tradition. A puzzling statement, you know. Most of the time or, or uh, you know, usually uh, the opposite happens. People make uh, immense efforts to escape tradition, but he made apparently immense efforts to remain within tradition. What would that mean? Well, I don't know. I, I, I'm inclined to, uh, to, to imagine he wanted to say that uh, maybe, uh, you know, uh, instinctually, so to speak, uh, he was a rebel. But he wanted uh, his rebelliousness to still remain somehow confined, a little bit at least, be tangent to what we call tradition. And uh, if we look at this building, it's, it's a, you know, moderately, a moderately a modernistic building, but not totally. There are here hesitations. I don't know if I should call them hesitations, maybe not appropriately. It's a house, it's a house which, yes, could belong to the second half of the 20th century, but, but, uh, somehow escapes an easy, uh, you know, uh, pinning down uh, to a specific uh, period. I, I like this very much, the ambiguity of it. And um, it's, it's really complex and uh, it, it escapes, uh, it, it, it escapes being, uh, uh, you know, connected uh, to a style, you know, it's, it's new and old somehow at the same time, and you don't quite know what, what we are looking at. Is it a house 
Is it a larger building, maybe even an industrial building, if you don't realize its scale from this uh, position? You realize it's not too big because you see the, the, the trees, you know? I mean, uh, they are taller than the building. And uh, look here. Yeah, we look at this uh, part of the house and uh, you don't know, you know, really this could have been a, a larger building uh, with some industrial parts, you know, or chimneys or whatever. It's very interesting really to be able to do something like this with a one family house. And then of course we have the, now we know he was teaching decoration if you can believe it you know and the, the decorative design or decoration and uh, and drawing but this modern architect he didn't have any problem to have ornamental uh, elements in his architecture clearly for all to see uh, while here is something else he can employ glass like uh, you know we so much love to do but even the framing of the glass is, uh, is rather unusual. He didn't uh, go for the dogmatic uh, horizontal uh, you know, glass of modernity. He uses rather vertical uh, mountains. Uh, I mean, there are mountains in general are vertical. I find it very, very interesting. Maybe even as a, a slight influence coming from Frank Lloyd Wright, um, you know, uh, I, I, we have to understand something. Uh, Carlos Scarpa was a very cultured man and architect. I mean, at this level, we cannot talk about ignorant architects. You know, he was not a commercial cheap shot. No, no, he had to have, you know, to create an architecture that is uh, meaningful and deep and, uh, you know, almost timeless. You cannot play games with culture. You have to be immersed in culture and not just the culture of your place and your time, but of all times and all places, you know, to be able to, I mean, look what's going on here. You know, he, he assimilated, he digested influences and then transformed them uh, creatively in an interesting and engaging way. Uh, this is, a, again, a, a very, a very deep lesson in architecture coming from this man. Um, th th there is also some kind of a weaving here in the making of the world. The interior is, of course, a comfortable, uh, you know, almost luxurious interior, but uh, it's, not, it's not commercial. I, I, I love this picture as well. You know, this kind of uh, um, window, large window, but uh, divided, fragmented, then here, we have, uh, you know, uh, again, I see the influence of, of uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, but uh, transform. Uh, a... Yes, there is, a, there is craft. There is clearly, this is an architect or a professor who uh, knew also about crafting a house. At the same time, not losing exaltation because the exaltation transformed the building into architecture. A very unusual architect. Villa Zopas, Corneliano in Treviso, 1957. Now I don't know what this is. It's a drawing, but I don't know if it's by him. It looks by him, but I don't know why I have these images uh, pixelated as they are. Maybe this is some kind of a, you know, uh, processed uh, image of the plan of this house. Uh, I wish I, I think I have later some images, I hope, or it, maybe it was not built. Let's, uh, let's read again about Villa Azopas in Treviso, 1957. I don't know. I don't know why I don't have pictures, but he did use this kind of, uh, you know, the presence of, uh, of uh, you know, cylinders or half cylinders or, uh, you know, almost almost complete, but not quite uh, cylinders in other in other instances. We'll see also Casa Veriti, another another Veriti. Um, this is the plan. This is the plan of the house. Um, I don't know. I mean, it has to be experienced. 
you know, this is not quite a circle here, is it? It's not. It's a deformed circle. It's not an ellipse either. It's it's like here, you know, it's a little bit off, but exactly this aspect that is, it is a little bit off makes it, I think, very valuable. And then look at these, you know, what are these, you know, scattered, you know, uh, color, columns, you know, they are the, the trademark of the building, but do you see they are not placed on a grid, you know, they are placed uh, rather capriciously. And, uh, talking about this capriciousness cannot be eliminated from architecture and in fact it shouldn't because capriciousness is an expression of subjectivity and those who think that subjectivity shouldn't enter the noble realm of architecture are wrong all important architectures are significantly subjective as well uh with this uh, kenneth frampton agreed as well he said that uh, um, you know, his choice of examples in his critical history of modern architecture are also, uh, you know, a subjective choice. Of course, in architecture, you cannot be totally objective. It's impossible and it's actually desirable not to be totally objective. Those who claim total objectivity do not refer to what I understand by architecture. They refer to something else. Um, Anyway, sorry about these small uh, small pictures. I guess I have to I have to improve this presentation. But you still see, you know, you can see how much a good architect can do, you know, with a you could say a simple house. There is no such a thing as simple house. You know, the the Le Cabanon by Le Corbusier is not simple at all. I mean, it is on one hand, but it's not simplistic. That's why, to be honest with you, I don't understand why uh, a diploma in the sixth year, after six years of studies, cannot be with a so-called little house. Why does it have to be a big building? You know, I mean, the craft, the sensitivity, the talent, the hard work, the complexity of the mind and the heart, of the imagination of an architect can be shown very well in a very small building in as much as it could be shown not at all in a very large building. I don't understand why, why we associate bigness with, uh, you know, uh, complexity or, uh, you know, uh, no, it has nothing to do with it. You know, there are much bigger buildings in the world than this uh, house that we look at here in the model, but they don't have the complexity of this uh, small house, uh, approximately small, uh, designed by, uh, by Carlos Scarpa. I love the windows. I mean, look at these windows. Uh, you know, this is, this, is, this is what an architect who refuses dogma, who refuses the dogma of, uh, that uh, Monsieur Le Corbusier or some others uh, try to impose on us. And he, yeah, I, I can see here that he, he didn't want to give up on tradition. He, there was something in him that, uh, that uh, remained connected and he wanted very much to remain connected with what we call tradition. But at the same time, he was uh, almost iconoclastic. It's both, and this, this makes his architecture maybe a little bit difficult, but beautifully so. Uh, it's a very fine house, really. Um, and it makes me smile when I think that he had to uh, use someone else to sign the drawings the, to get a permit for the house because he didn't have the right, right? I, I mean. It, truly, his architecture is about the, the, the reclaiming the fragment, reclaiming the fragment, you know, placing the fragment at the center in a way, 
Casa Boldo, Bolboni, Venezia, 1964-1974. Um, here is a little bit, um, he actually built, uh, it's an existing housing uh, complex uh, and uh, he just built something in front of you see in the back, the existing building, he just built this thing, which you, it's almost hard to see because it's covered by, uh, you know, by plants. Uh, I keep saying to the, to the students, if the facade of your building doesn't uh, turn out well, no problem. Just, uh, just let the ivy to climb on, on, on the facade and it will take care of your facade very, very well. I never saw a building covered with ivy or some other plants that looks bad. No, no. So I, in my opinion, it's not even necessary any longer to study a facade. You just allow the ivy to climb on the building, or if you are more cynically inclined or more commercially inclined, you invite Sony or Hitachi or uh, Kelvin Klein to uh, adorn the building with some, uh, uh, with some banners. Because this might happen anyway. So <laughs> I'm a little bit cynical myself now, but here you can see the, the little addition that he created here. Uh, you know, easier because uh, the plants didn't yet uh, become wild. Even here, this is architecture, you know, and maybe with a capital A, if we are to be emphatic. But in his case, it's not necessary to be emphatic. Look at the steps, two steps, that's it, two steps. But this is an architectural event, two steps, that's it. I mean, really, if we look at Carlos Carpa and then Luca Peters, uh, Peter Zumtor, we see the difference between a really good architect and one who uh, anyway, I don't know if he designed also the interior here, although this was his metier because he was teaching interior design. I guess he did, yeah. He did, he designed it. And, and there are idiosyncratic elements because it seems that the interior, I mean, there is there are levels of modernity that uh, seem to be in conflict with what uh, uh, Frampton said that he made great efforts to uh, escape, uh, to, to escape uh, the, the temptation to run away from uh, tradition. Here, there is a lot of slickness, which I find uh, intriguing, not to say uh, something else, you know. Uh, I don't know. I don't know very well what to think about this interior, which is so slick and glittering. And rather mundane, isn't it? No, I, I, I wouldn't describe uh, Carlos Carpa as being a non sinner No, no. I think uh, he harbored uh, uh, sinful thoughts like uh, many artists, actually. Uh, sinful from the perspective of the righteous one, the, the petit bourgeois. But uh, no, no, there are sensualities here. I mean, look even at the, look at this stair, you know, is. Uh, or maybe I'm in a bad mood, so to speak. I uh, I don't know. I, it seems to me it's rather erotical this uh, thing. I, but uh, it's true. I, I am going through some crisis now. Or or look here. Now, if this is not erotical, I don't know what is. You know, it's. It's almost indecent, really. It's it's. Uh, we know that Carlos Carpa was a sensuous architect, but uh, here uh, the, the expression of his sensuality is almost alarming, abstract as it is, or abstracted. Interesting man, interesting architect. I'm not so sure that this kitchen though is so interesting, but it's a kitchen on the other hand, and on the other hand, for God's sake. I know that our world is obsessed by kitchen and uh, kitchens and uh, uh, Arch Daily proves uh, this uh, simple truth and painful truth for me every day, you know, glorifying, um, I don't know many, how many models of, uh, you know, incredible uh, kitchens and so on. Uh, 
Now look here. <laughs> yeah, I, I have to smile. I have to laugh, and I have to. I have to vibrate. I have to. I have to respond to this. You know, it's again, it's magical. This is magical. Why would he do it like this? You know. I mean, each piece is 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 crafted, you know, uh, you know, handcrafted. Is is uh, the, these are handmade pieces, one of a kind, to show what? I mean, we see here two pairs of uh, of couples, two couples in a way, you know, it's one couple and another couple. Then there is another couple here. Again, here we have. Uh, sorry, I almost feel like uh, um, you know talking. Uh, beyond certain limits, but uh, uh, I, I don't know why I find I, I, his architecture and his so-called uh, details so uh, uh, sensuous and erotical, you know, this is, uh, uh, I better shut up. <laughs> I better shut up, but, uh, The house on the Grand Canal is this one. We saw the, the building already. Anesso a Casa de Benedetti, Bonaiuto, Roma, 1965-1972. This one is in Rome and uh, it's hidden. I, I learned about it late. Um, uh, I didn't know he built in Rome, but uh, well, the sculptures are not by him, but again and again, what do we see? Two lovers. But, you know, here we have two lovers and here we have we have six lovers. That's why I almost said this is, uh, I better stop. But we have one pair of lovers, another pair of lovers. Actually, there are more than six because you can look at them differently. Here is a pair, another couple is here, another couple is here, but you could also see that this is a couple, this is a couple, my God, I better stop. But, but you know, yeah. It's love, but he didn't do the sculpture, of course, the statues, they are not his, but it doesn't matter. It goes with, it goes with Carlos Scarpa, although the building doesn't show explicitly what the statue does or the, or the sculptures. But he also have even, you know, transfigured as it is, you know, because this, you know, part of the stair, which is so ingeniously done, actually, I mean, <laughs> Uh, I, I feel like I analyzing it really, I should stop because I uh, soon I, I might need Dr. Freud to be near me. But look here, here is one, one thread, here is another thread, and the other thread in between comes from the opposite side. So it's, if this is not Eros, I don't know what it is, you know, and it, it, it goes again, you know, it's even this vertical part, of the because the, the, the thread becomes column, uh, it's divided into two. So we have continuously a two-ness. But but what is here? Here is a two-ness as well, explicitly so. But abstractly, uh, in his architecture, he does this all the time. Two elements playing tango or dancing dunk, tango, you know, uh, hide and seek or whatever. There is always a two-ness at, at, at play. And, and this is what makes his architecture so, uh, on one hand, a little bit unsettling, enticing. Uh, this is great art, really. He might have had a strange, uh, you know, uh, taste for eyeglasses, but uh, I think uh, looking at this picture, you imagine how this stair was done. Um, and you, you see it only, you know, it's not explicit. It's not, you don't get it immediately. You know, that in the playfulness of these parts, which uh, interlock themselves into this uh, abstracted geometrical uh, erotical dance, uh, you, 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 you discover the, the source of life here only after a while, not immediately because it is abstracted. And this is what art is supposed to do. Uh, James Joyce in the portrait of the artist as a young man, 
uh, Stephen has a discussion with a colleague and they arrive at the conclusion that, now I think Stephen, that Dalus um, uh, advocated the idea that uh, good art should never be explicitly uh, erotical. And I would agree with Stephen that Dalus here also, it's not explicit, it's implicit and it is abstracted. But the essence of life, which is eros, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is present. You just have to be in the mood, so to speak, uh, maybe, you know, on, uh, on, uh, on the background of uh, all kinds of, uh, you know, uh, frustrations or whatever. Anyway, um, strange building though, this one in Rome. But one thing is for sure, you can talk more about a building by Carlos Carpa, just one building, one single building, one single house, then you can talk about, uh, you know, uh, large uh, so-called urban development. Casa Bellotto, 1944-1956, we are going a little bit backwards here in time. And look at, look at, look at, look at the pavement on the, on, on, on the floor. Look at the ornamental design, if we are to call it a design on the floor. What modern architect would do something like this? I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, I, I actually find it very, very nice. And, uh, and, uh, but uh, in an unsettling way, it's, it's, it's so, you know, it's, it's decorative, it's, um, it's 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 a little no it's not neurotical but it is decorative and it is uh, um, the ornamental uh, part of it is so uh, explicitly ornamental that you would say this cannot be a modern house but it is a modern house it is a modern house very much so and we'll see other things you know uh, it's and it's not a rug it, it's part of the i hope it's not a rug and i, I i'm just you know uh, singing here the the beauty of a rug instead of the beauty of architecture it's an aristocratic house an aristocratic apartment it's it's um, it's um, you know uh, built for someone well to do uh, it shows that this man was teaching interior design indeed Look at, look at this, this is also a little bit off, or maybe it's just the picture. It's possible that it's just the picture, but I'm not sure. This is an interesting aspect of the, the architecture of, of uh, Carlos Scarpa. Um, Saul Steinberg uh, said something very interesting uh, that um, uh, the genius has something awkward, uh, some, no, not awkward, this is not the, the word. Uh, clumsy. There is a clumsiness. This is this is very interesting because usually we think that uh, the work that is splendid, that is uh, you know uh, genial, you know, is uh, is uh, is perfect. Is um, it doesn't have anything uh, idiosyncratic, and is not true. Is not true. Uh, is not easy. Is not. It's not an easy work. It's not. It's not easily decipherable. And and here, I think in his architecture is the same thing. Some things are seem to be a little bit off, almost dissonant. Sometimes you could even think that maybe some something even a, a, a slight cacophony, aesthetical cacophony, maybe. But is it, it, it all makes sense in time if you digest the work and and you begin to understand it. And if there are impurities, those impurities actually belong to life itself. And the good work reflects a deeply felt and lived life. Did he do this uh, panel again? Welcome to ornament. I don't know if maybe he did, maybe he didn't. He obviously, I mean, after all, he was earning a living teaching uh, decorative, uh, you know, uh, decoration or whatever it was, Casa Carlos Carpa, but I couldn't find pictures of it, although I'm very curious. I took this uh, list with his works from the, the Italian uh, Wikipedia, but I couldn't find images or I was not patient enough, searching enough. Casa Carlos Carpa, if any of you who are here, 
will uh, discover it, please be kind if you want. If you want, uh, contact me. I am curious to see it. Casa Curto Cuero, 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 Belluno. Uh, this one also is, is almost infuriating, this house, actually, because you might even be inclined at one point to say it's a joke. You know, it, it's... <laughs> really, if you look at the building on the right and you look at this building, uh, I mean, if you didn't know Carlos Scarpa made it, uh, I'm sure you would pass by it without even stopping. You know, uh, maybe the extravagance of the oblongs a little bit, but otherwise, no, no. You, you might even think this is a, the house, uh, a house built by what in Romania some uh, in my opinion, not very kind people call, uh, you know, uh, the work of, uh, of a Dorel. You know, I really don't like that, um, you know, uh, habit that some architects have to call a work which is done, uh, you know, clumsily, uh, you know, that there was a Dorel who, who did it. Uh, I don't think uh, is, uh, is a nice thing to say, but anyway. Um, now, let, let's contemplate this house a little bit. Well, what do we see here? You know, we see like in the case of any house, an entrance, we see windows. Uh, we, here we see also some oblongs, which in traditional uh, architecture uh, were a common feature. And I think they should come back because uh, they are very useful oblongs from, uh, from various points of view. Uh, what do we see here? You know, what's going on here? This is a water collector that collects water and then goes inside the wall? How could this be? Is it not supposed to actually bring the water outside of the wall? It's, it's unusual. And look at this uh, corner here. You know, I understand the reason of this, but this, this is not done very often. And uh, what else is curious here? You know, even the way the windows, the opening are placed, the house seems to be like a banal house with some uh, funny things or whimsical things a little bit, but whimsicality is not, like look at this oblong, it's only half the height of the window, the bottom half. How could this be? Maybe on the other side is the other, like in this case, I imagine this is the case, but even this is unusual, right? To have uh, oblongs done in this way, Again, it's about two nests, about pairs, about a couple. You know, he could have done the, 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 the oblongs like here, but even here, one oblong is divided into two, and then one triangle itself is divided into two. Uh, but, but this kind of oblongs I, I, I never saw before, you know, where uh, half of the oblong uh, takes care of the bottom of the, uh, of the half bottom, of the, of the window and the other one of the top half. It's unusual, it's unusual. And, but, but this is what a creative architect does, sometimes does, hopefully more often than not, uh, unusual things. And that's why we talk about him and not about an architect who does things like everybody else does them. Um, look at this, it, it, I find it almost amazing. And these oblongs, you know, they, I find them very interesting. And yes, whimsical, uh, playful, and uh, a little bit uh, maybe viciously so. There is a little bit of aesthetical perversion here, but because of it, the building escapes banality. And at the same time, it is banal, because we cannot say that it's a, you know, it's a revolutionary building and so No, it's not. He never intended to create a revolutionary building. It's a little bit kinky, this facade, isn't it? Like that uh, big ring, uh, big, uh, ring that he wears uh, wear on his right hand. On the other hand, look what's going on in the back. Totally unexpected. Let's hope, look, look at this. Totally unexpected. I mean, who? Who think that in the back of this building, we would discover this? 
it's it's uh, you know Carlos Scarpa was quite something. I I think he enjoyed himself. I really think he enjoyed even the difficulties of being uh, you know an architect who didn't have the right to signature and he had to associate himself with a less skillful architect in order to to build anything. Um, This is a less known building. I told you I have a long presentation of, about Carlos Scarpa, and uh, I, 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 I'm a little bit proud of the fact that I show lesser known works by him. And I think in the case of an important architect, it is important to know everything they did, because it is my opinion that uh, the worst work of a good architect is better than the best work of a worthless architect. So even the mistakes of a, of, a, of a great architect are better. At least they are interesting. At least the mistake is, uh, you know, provocative and so on, if it is a mistake. Now, why would he do this, you know, uh, this? Because this is, again, uh, you know, ornamental. And you say it's superfluous. Yes, it is superfluous, perhaps. I don't see what function it could have, uh, but, Let's recall Voltaire, who was praising the superfluous. I think I think would be nice if you, the students, would have a uh, you know a program for a project. Maybe okay, a, a short pro, a project, not a long one, not for two months, but for two weeks or four weeks, for a superfluous building or a superfluous house. How would you do it after? after you were tortured with Neufert and rules and regulations for a long time. How would you do a superfluous building? But uh, let's be honest, we all enjoy what is interdicted. We all enjoy, in fact, those are the most enjoyable uh, uh, elements of life. What is useless, what is even interdicted? Why are they so pleasant? Why is it so pleasant to do what is interdicted. Why? I'm asking a question. I am expecting an answer after the presentation. Casa Estudio Gallo. Now look here. What did he do here? Why? This is, uh, you know, uh, he transformed a piece of glass into an artwork. Are we thinking about doing something like this? Very rarely, if at all. No. Do all the pieces of furniture sit well in this space? I think so. Um, I don't know what that person is doing there. Is she, she is, is she a she? Probably, you know, I hope uh, that space is not at the, you know, up, up, up there at the incredible height. Um, now this, these uh, armchairs are not his, of course. But look at the frames of the look at the frames of the doors. These are this would would uh, would uh, scare away, uh, you know, the minimalist or uh, Bjarke Ingels or uh, many of our stars today, because they are so heavy and brown, brown. What architect today would make such frames? No, not to my knowledge. No, this is uh, antique. This is um, obsolete. This is a dinosaur. Uh, no, Casa Studio Scaturi. Scaturi. Now look at this there. Now I would ask the functionalist, how do you bring the how do you bring the piano upstairs? You can't. You can't. But then, do you really have to bring the piano upstairs? Of course, the angle of this stair is illegal. Zvi Hacker was right. Great art, or yeah, real art and real architecture cannot be totally legal. This is not a legal stair, is it? I mean, any student of architecture and any architect would agree with me. This is not a legal stair. If you do something like this in school, you will go home with a terrible grade. Terrible. But Carlos Scarpa, a force in, 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 in 20th century architecture, he did it. 
And I actually think he did it with joy. And to be honest with you, I would like to be a toddler who climbs this stair. I would love to use this stair more than a so-called legal and perfect and functional stair. I think it's a delicious stair. It is. Yes, you might not go upstairs with a piano or downstairs for that matter, but forget it, you know, you could. You know, you could go with an electronic Yamaha of a moderate size if you indeed you need a piano of some sort upstairs. I love this stair. I love it. Doesn't matter how you look at it. And yes, it's 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 uh, it's narrow and but and and the zigzagging intrigues me and attracts me. You know that's why I keep saying good art and good architecture. Uh, should be disobedient. And he was disobedient. And he created a special thing in a context where most architects would have done nothing, nothing special, nothing. Well, he did something special, something very pleasing for the eye as well. Bravo, Scarpa. I don't know about this. Uh, I mean, I cannot keep the, the floor clean in a much small room. There, you know, it's. It's probably a floor to look at, not to step on. It's very possible. Casa Zent Zentner in Zurich. He built in Zurich too, 1963. Uh, it's more Swiss in a way, but not totally. There are interesting th things here as well. Um, again, the, 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 the insertion of the old in a way, you know, this is uh, again, a certain reference to Frank Lloyd Wright. There is something of the old here. A little, sorry, I, I know Frank Lloyd Wright would totally protest to call his, uh, you know, uh, uh, presence as belonging to the old. But you know what? What I mean? You know, this is uh, the fragment. I mean, this canopy here, this cornice, is uh, a little bit uh, off. It's not part of the same aesthetics like here. And yes, it belongs to a, an assimilated culture from another time, still modernistic, but uh, another time and maybe even another continent. This one I find a little bit more predictable than some other buildings by him, but uh, still uh, there are things to, to be discovered. Like this unusual, you know, look at this stair. It is, uh, it is unusual and I, I, I wouldn't really call it beautiful. It's, it's rather strange, you know, Anyway, I, 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 I couldn't find a, a better word. I use the word strange. In Zurich, Carlos Carpa, <clears throat> Villa Barto, Bartolotto. Here he worked with Angelo Massieri, 1950, 1952. Uh, it's not very clear to me what they did here. I really were, I mean, it's not that I want applauses or compassion, but I really work hard for this compilation of images because I have about 400 and it was hard to find sometimes images with these buildings scattered, uh, uh, who knows where. Casa Giacomucci, he built, he built, you know, this man who didn't have the right to build, he did build, you know, again, look at this there, a creation. And this is for the beautiful site created by an architect in Suchava. I really recommend you this website uh, is, is excellent, offhouses.com. It truly is. Maybe, uh, I mean, the, 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 the precise good taste with which every picture is chosen justifies uh, this uh, logo here, although he didn't take the pictures. They were taken probably from the magazines or I don't know how he obtained the pictures, but the choice belongs to him. And uh, it's even 
perfectly placed on the page. It's, uh, it's an excellent, excellent website of houses. You can see it, it's supposed to be about unknown houses or forgotten houses, but all the best architecture in this field of, of houses is present there in that, in that beautiful uh, website. A casa, another casa in collaboration with several people this time. Uh, this is an interesting work from 1974, 1979. It means it was finalized after he died because he died in 1978. Uh, casa Otolenghi, I don't know if I pronounce well or if uh, the accent I place correctly, probably not. I apologize, I don't know yet Italian, but I'm attracted to the Italian language um, very much lately. And look at this, didn't I say that if you allow the ivy to climb on your building, the ivy will make any, even the ugliest building a beautiful building. It's true, it is true. Take the ugliest building in the world and just allow the ivy to climb on it and you get a good building maybe a beautiful building. Now, this building probably would have been nice even with the part without the participation of the green, but the green adds to it and uh, beautifully so. Very nice. It's true, he uses, I mean, I, I, I look at this, look at this piece here. <laughs> Did you ever see something like this before? The way is it, it is zigzagging. A more common architect would have placed this thing in the center and have it straight if indeed he would have done it. But he did it in this way. And this is very symptomatic of Carlos Scarpa that somehow he assumes the difficulty because he tried to imagine drawing the plan. And you want to have this uh, piece for the, the, you know, the evacuation of the water. And, you know, it almost goes into this column, you know, or uh, what appears to be a column. And instead of him moving it, uh, you know, away from it, he leaves, he leaves it there and then zigzags around it. So it avoids it. I find this beautiful. I, I find this a, a lesson in architecture. Really, I know the conventional architect uh, would protest, but uh, I have my thoughts. Uh, allow me, please, to, uh, to have my own thoughts about, uh, about Carlos Scarpa. Uh, again, he creates uh, uh, something very special in, uh, in a place where most architects didn't even think of doing anything, really. It, it, it's really amazing. Uh, it's amazing. I mean, I'm really sorry, but there is more architecture here than in a huge Hilton hotel, or it doesn't have to be Hilton built by the most brilliant uh, star of today. There is more because there is life and it shows the tensions, even the torturous aspects of life, the conflict, the avoidance, the timidity, the attraction, the, 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 the rejection. Again, I think it's about Eros. I, I, I really think so. Look at it. I really, I, I feel like uh, arresting the presentation right here and just contemplate together with you this picture for at least 20 minutes or half an hour. <laughs> this is genius. I'm sorry, I don't very often use this word, but I think it is. It makes me smile, it makes me happy. It makes me less afraid of the, the ephemerality of life and you know the, the afterlife or whatever. It's, <laughs> It's, it, it's like the Swedish knight uh, uh, playing chess with death uh, on the beach in the beautiful uh, film by Ingmar Bergman, The Seventh Seal. Can you imagine playing chess with death, you know, and even entertaining the illusion that you can win? Of course he doesn't win. But this is beautiful about the human beings that we believe we can play chess with death and we can win. And of course, we cannot win. Uh, so, so welcome to the superfluous. No, uh, it's about the superfluousness of the beauty 
that exist still exist in, in human life and in human beings. I love this. I really love here. I, I could write a book just about this, what I look at here. <laughs> Uh, the interior either. I mean, has moments of monumentality, which are a little bit, uh, I, I don't even know why, what's happening with these huge, uh, you know, columns. You know, maybe he was hiding within uh, what Louis Kahn was hiding in those towers of Richard's laboratories, some pipes. I don't know, probably not. Why did he make them like this? I, I don't know, maybe, it, it, I, I don't know. Maybe to bring into this house, which is a private house, echoes of the Imperial Rome, Imperial Italy, you know, uh, the Roman times, you know, to, 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 to give the illusion that, yes, we are in modernity, but uh, echoes of that glorious past could show up in some form. I don't know. I don't know, but they are, they are, uh, you know, their dimensions and the, even their aesthetics are a little bit... Uh, you know, uh, strange in this context, you know, they, they don't seem to belong here. <laughs> Again, we are talking about the, the awkwardness, the clumsiness even of, uh, of some aspects of, uh, and look at the ceiling. Not only it is black, but what's going on there? You know, I mean, who would make a black ceiling? Very interesting architect. This gentleman, Carlos Scarpa. What is life? What is life? Do we know? What is life? What is architecture? Maybe right, uh, uh, his friend Luis Kahn was right. Architecture does not exist. What about this statement? Architecture does not exist. <laughs> I loved Mark Wigley, whom I, in the past, I didn't love. In fact, I wrote violently against him, but I love, I love him for the fact that when he became Dean at Columbia University in New York, he wrote an introduction to the school for the future applicants saying, we do not know what architecture is. Can you imagine the dean of the school at Columbia writing and he signed it. We do not know what architecture is, but we are willing to explore the question, what is architecture together with you? Nice, very, very nice. So very different for those overconfident, uh, you know, uh, leaders of schools who claim they know everything or professors. No professor will tell you, I don't know what architecture is. All of them have the answers, <laughs> the wrong answers. Anyway, I, again, Luis Kahn, the friend of Carlos Carpa said, the question well asked is better than the best or the most beautiful answer. It's true. Now it's true, he was a Talmudist, but uh, beyond that, he was true. He was true, and what's going on here? Really, I mean, why did he, why this reef, why this cut? Didn't I mention the two-ness, the two elements, the couple? Well, he understood that a, a, a monolith needs uh, something against it, and then he cuts into it, it's, it's a, it's a wounded monolith in a way, but it's not really wounded. The word maybe is not uh, appropriate, but, but that cut makes, makes the whole piece interesting and enticing sculpturally, architecturally, visually, aesthetically. Not many architects would do something like this. He did it. As we know, this house was not finalized with him alive but was almost finalized when he died. There was finished in 1979 and he died in 1978. It also has aspects of a ruin, 
a little bit, although it's not ruined. And I think this is very difficult to do, to do a house which is not ruined, but which might generate somehow a feeling of uh, being a ruin. That's very difficult to do. And, uh, and if you achieve doing that, you, you are far in your development as an architect. Uh, he didn't do this, but uh, it's beautiful. Casa Borgo, Vicenza. Vicenza, which is the city of Andrea Palladio. This is a building uh, I saw several times with students when uh, we travel to Vicenza. And uh, it's a building, it's an apartment building. It's an apartment building uh, not far away from the train station in Vicenza. And yes, it is in the city owned still and will forever be uh, Palladio city, Vicenza. But as we read in his uh, biography, he was born in Venice, Carlos Scarpa, but then lived for some a number of years in Vicenza. This, <laughs> This building, which appears to be, you know, at the first sight, uh, not, uh, you know, here I, we have uh, the architecture students, I guess. In, I'm not sure. I, 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 I almost recognize myself with the students here, but I don't recognize. It's possible these are other students. Anyway, it doesn't matter who they are. This is an apartment building in Vicenza by Carlos Scarpa, and the only recognizable um, uh, relationing to, I said, relationing to um, uh, Andrea Palladio are these uh, round, uh, you know, uh, things at the top of the building. Otherwise, it's entirely a Carlos Scarpa building. But here I see a certain reference to those holes in uh, Basilica Palladiana in Vicenza by, of course, Andrea Palladio. Look at the awkwardness, I mean awkwardness, you know, look at these small balconies, look at uh, not every window has them, vertical windows, not vert or horizontal windows. And then is the splendor, I call it splendor, of these uh, reddish metallic uh, structural elements which uh, are uh, masterfully uh, you know, uh, having a, a, a dialectical um, relationship with the, with the whole of the building. And you'll see also the corner of the building soon is, um, again, it's about the eros between two entities that play hide and seek, that, they, that there is a tension between them. And in between them, there is, uh, there is um, you know, attraction and, uh, and, and rejection. This is the side. Uh, the side uh, uh, elevation of the building. Uh, again, through this gesture at the top, he connects with Palladio. It's just a rather discreet uh, homage to Palladio, I would say. Otherwise, the building is totally Carlos Carpa. Uh, <laughs> this is beautiful that you know, a block of flats, that's what it is. It is a block of flats, an apartment building. You know, most architects who do a more or less correct apartment building. But, you know, there is more to it. You know, it's, you know, at, at, the, at, at the ground level, uh, he dramatizes certain elements. You know, all of a sudden we have uh, the drama of uh, dynamic architecture, concrete, uh, exposed concrete, that here is also the entrance. Then there is here a door which goes into a short, a small courtyard in front of the, you know, the elevation of the building. I hope, I, look at this. Just look at this. <laughs> really, again, again, this is art. This is art. This is art. I mentioned before when I commented on that drawing and uh, maybe that drawing was actually made for, for this situation, for this building. Although this motif, he repeats it in some other places. I mean, most architects forget about, you know, using, uh, I mean, it's not just in, in terms of material. Here we have concrete and here we have metal, but also the colors. 
this is red, this is light uh, gray. And then here, most architects would have just had, a, you know, a beam, you know, going all the way. And here probably they would have had just one column, but this is not good enough for Carlos Scarpa. He wanted to have two. And the two-ness repeats itself, uh, you know, even vertically. Before the column, the concrete column reaches the beam, there is a third element, a third entity that itself is divided into two and makes the transition from the concrete uh, to the metal. And, and, and then you have the beam accommodating this third element by becoming less, less thick or less high. And this is splendid. You know, it's, it shows here, it's, it's a series of negotiations. He creates an architectural event out of nothing, you might say, out of nothing. This is the poetry of life and architecture right here. You know, it's, 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 it's amazing, you know? And, and, and then you have this beam and this beam, they are almost touching each other, but not quite. They are, so it's always a two-ness, always a couple, uh, two entities that, that, that uh, are in close proximity. And that's why Frampton talked about the adoration of the joint. Adoration expresses a feeling of desire not necessarily satisfied. It's a longing. You know, I think, I think this, this verb, which in Romanian also finds a very nice, very uh, an excellent word in door, this longing, just a tangire, to long, to long for the other. You know, you could say this beam longs for the other beam. This column longs to, to me the, the, the beam. Uh, it's all, it's a series of longings here. And uh, it's, it's, it's thus process becoming, becomes part of being, being and becoming at the same time. And the dialectics of becoming are, uh, uh, you know, intertwined with, uh, with being. And I think it's beautiful. Look at them. I mean, it's the same thing that Brancusi did in Parta Sarutului, didn't he? You know, uh, it's the same thing. It's the very same thing. This is, this is what the architect is supposed to do, to pay homage to the sources of life, to the essence of life in a loving way, in a longing way, and find ways, abstractive ways, to express this. I mean, really, can we, after we watch this, can we be satisfied any longer with the banality of our columns? Does, doesn't matter if round or square and the banality of the, of the, of the beams and, and the banality of the meeting between the two? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. I think some of these pictures are taken by me. I mean, I like to think so, although I usually lose track of, of the pictures. I took many pictures, but I, I lost most of the time. Just look here, you know, I mean, it, it's beautiful. Of course, the pedantic architect would protest, would say, wait a minute, these, these walls are dirty. What, are, what, 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 what does that person think? This is Andrei Tarkovsky at his best. You know, this is an homage to the rain, to the elements, to the poetry of life. And what is here is Romeo and Juliet. That's what it is. This actually is better than the tower called Romeo and Juliet by uh, his much admired Frank Lloyd Wright. <laughs> this is beautiful. It's like two teenagers kissing behind the bushes. You know, so their parents or some morose adults would not see that. That's what it is. Great. This is great. Maybe I myself in a curious mode now, but I, I uh... Casa Romanelli. 
And this one also, I find it exceptional because it is modern, but not quite. Uh, you might even say it's the refurbishment or the renewal of some uh, of an older house or something. And look at the frames, as opposed to the obsession that we have with frameless glass, as you know very well now in mainstream architecture. The smaller the frame, the better. That's what we think. In fact, if we don't have a frame at all, that would be the ideal. That's what we think. But that's not that's not what Carlos Scarpa thought. Carlos Scarpa loved, you know, very heavy frames. Look at them; they are heavy. They are almost pieces of furniture. You know, they become uh, <clears throat> imposing almost. But they give the character of the house. <clears throat> and, <clears throat> and I think uh, um, I think they 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 show a different sensibility than uh, most uh, modern architects have. Uh, this is the plan. Look at look at this in plan. You know, it's incredible what he did here. Uh, I I don't know what this is, but uh, it's it's uh, it's quite something. You know, it's it's. I again, I I, I think it's eros. <laughs> Maybe unsatisfied eros, but eros. Villa Villa Palazzetto in Padova, Padova. <laughs> Now, I am sure this was an old building, an existing building, and he just added uh, these things at the front. And maybe, maybe I'm not sure he modified, uh, uh, you know, these uh, rather strange things on the top of the roof. But look at the stair and look at what's going on here. You know, it's a framing, it's a framing, but, but it's a framing uh, with the uh, with disruptions of its being, and it's all concrete, but it's, uh, uh, you know, there is, look, it's dangerous, you know, uh, no handrail here. Uh, good architects usually, uh, they either are exquisite in uh, designing beautiful handrails or they hate handrail, handrails altogether, or like Le Corbusier, places, at least in one case, the handrail where the wall is and not on this side, which is absurd. That's what he did, uh, Le Corbusier, at that uh, building for the textile workers in Ahmedabad. Uh, and he himself actually ris risked his life on that stair. There is a picture of Le Corbusier walking on such a stair without a handrail where it is supposed to be with his back uh, against the wall because, and behind him is Doshi, the much younger uh, Doshi, who was uh, ready at, in, in any unfortunate case to save uh, the master's life. Architects are strange. <laughs> Not just architects, of course, but um, I look, look here. Didn't we talk about the two-ness, about the two? Well, here again, Romeo and Juliet, again, intersecting, making love to each other, right here in the water. And, you know, to, to, to do it in the water, the, the experts say it's even better. Uh, it's, <laughs> he enjoyed himself. What else can we say? Yeah, of course, there was someone who uh, afforded these uh, um, exotisms from, from Carlos Carpa. Uh, I think, uh, if I remember correctly, his son worked on this building. Um, this is also interesting, and I, I think was built by his son, if my memory is correct. It is a little bit different from, uh, from but here we also see the play with two-ness. I don't want to, you know, exaggerate this import, the importance of this two-ness, but I think it is. Even here, you know, we have a left element and the right, and between them there is a rift. And uh, yeah, but but he didn't finalize this work, and it's possible he didn't even work a lot on this. It, it was it was his son. Monuments. He did monuments too. Tomba Fed Vettore Rizzo, Venezia, 1940. 1940. Um, I hate that there is that thing in the middle of the picture, but 
it was very hard to, to arrive to find the uh, pictures with these works. And I found this website, uh, casapaladio.org. Um, It ruined the picture for the authorship. What can we do? You know, for them it was more important the authorship than the, the integrity of the picture. Sad. Age picture is like this ruined because of the ego of the whatever photographer or whoever did it. You know, how different we are from the builders of the Hindu temples or the builders of the beautiful Gothic cathedrals. Who didn't they had who didn't need to accept the authorship at all? And they built cathedrals. And here is just a photographer, so full of himself, cutting the picture in two to ruin it essentially, in order to assert himself. It's disgraceful. Uh, disgraceful again. I can't enjoy now Carlos Scarpa because of this fool who had to place the whatever, you know. And uh, not once he could have done it discreetly. No, it's uh, an enfilade of uh, uh, signatures. And they're all pictures like this, all ruined, all of them. But behind this, uh, what do we see? We see that, uh, you know, unsettled and unsettling cube uh, eroded in the center geometrically. So this is a little monument. It's a cube, but it's a it's not a very stable cube. It uh, has the instability that existed within Carlos Scarpa and uh, he, that, that he consciously or, or unconsciously promoted. Basamento de la Scultura La Partigiana di Leoncillo in Venezia, 1955. He just did the pedestal. The sculpture does not belong to him. I love both the sculpture and the pedestal. And it's not easy to do a pedestal. This uh, Constantin Brancus knew very well because the pedestal has to be a little bit different from what it springs from. In other words, to, to be a little more uh, elevated or sophisticated or uh, yeah, to, to, you know, a little bit more artistic than, than the slab or the ground, but not to compete with the artwork. So it has to have a, if I am to express myself oxymoronically, a reticent um, exaltation. This is the role of a pedestal to be, uh, to have a, uh, to be a, um, you know, moderately exalted or very discreetly exalted, to have a, a reticent exaltation. The exaltation is supposed to belong to the sculpture which, uh, you know, the less trained in uh, avant-garde art or modern art uh, would say this is not art. So you might say the pedestal is more elaborated and more ar art or artsy than the artwork itself. But I'm not so sure. I actually love the artwork and I also love what the architect did. Carlos Carpa, look here. This is again, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's exquisite architectural art because this man understood that he cannot place, again, that's why Carlos um, uh, Kenneth Frampton talked about the adoration of the joint. This piece, the artwork doesn't just, you know, uh, sit on the pedestal. There is this transitional element, the third entity that I mentioned before, and the third element itself has its special place, this little alcove, this channel. So it's beautiful. So let's imagine that pianistal grows, grows, and then it arrives at a point where the third element, which is supposed to negotiate between it and the artwork, is supposed to be inserted. So what does Carpa does? Creates this... Uh, depression into the top of the pedestal to accommodate this, as I call it, the third element. So this, this is a continuous negotiation between uh, various parts that are supposed to come together without losing their identity. This is great art. Out of nothing, you say, just a pianistal, for God's sake, for a sculpture, which most people would call is not a sculpture. 
But I, again, I, I can look at it and, and, and smile and be happy and enjoy it and write, write about it a few pages at least. This is the art of architecture. It is. <laughs> and again, I think it's erotical and spiritual at the same time. It's both. Very nice. Very, very nice. Carlos Carpa is sending towards us a clan day. That's what he does with such things. And you see the artwork again, there is a spacing between the pedestal. In essence, the, this massive pedestal in structural terms was not needed to support. I mean, the pedestal is much more monumental than the sculpture itself. The supporting part of this uh, piece, if I am to call it a piece, is, 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 is bigger than, than the supporting. So, but, but the connection between the two is done through this third element, which is, uh, <laughs> it's in a way whimsical, it's a little bit mysterious, it's, you have to notice it to enjoy it. It's like a good, and I'm, I'm far from being an expert in cookies, but it is said that the French know something about they, they, in that they know how to price the smallest cake, uh, you know, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Paris uh, costs a fortune. Uh, but it's, it's a little bit something like this. I remember Emile Choran saying that he only learned how to eat uh, in, in France. It's possible. I live for a short while in France. I never learned how to eat and I never will. But apparently Emil Choran who lived for much longer, he did. Uh, well, also helped by his girlfriend who went to work while Emil Choran was reflecting on the French uh, uh, food and Bach and God. Uh, and he doesn't even mention her name in in many in any of his writings, which I thought is very very unfair, uh, very unfair. She was going to work to bring uh, food, uh, so the you know the immigrant uh, Emil Choran would enjoy, and he doesn't even say thank you on one page to Simon, his girlfriend. When I arrived in Saint Pierre de Montparnasse at his grave, and I saw that there are two people. But there, I couldn't believe my eyes. I, I thought Emil Choran was all his life alone. Was not true. He had a girlfriend for 50 years, five zero, 50 years. And Simone is there with him, with Emil, in Domus Eterna, talking about tombs, Tomba, Rinaldo Lazzari, where, or 1960. A tomb it is. But don't we see again the two-ness? You know, and the oneness here. It, it, this is actually, uh, it's um, Rinaldo Lazzari. I imagine a couple, maybe, or it, it refers to the uh, uh, duality within a person that is possible too, because the masculine uh, animus and anima exist in both of in, in all of us. So there is a two-ness within each one of us as well. Uh, so we, you know, it's 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 a simple gravestone, but uh, looking more carefully to it, uh, maybe it's not so. Look here again, you know, why did he do it in this way? You know, it's again, this is art. It's art, and so is here. Uh, this this is truly beautiful. Uh, this uh, depression here, you know, is uh, uh, with uh, this. Uh, he was obsessed by the two circles that come from the, the Orient, the two circles intersecting. You can see them at the uh, Brion Cemetery as well. We see them in this, on this uh, uh, tombstone, uh, transfigured, but uh, still uh, uh, recognizable because it's, it's kind of a trademark. Again, we see just like at Salk Institute in La Jolla, California by Louis Kahn, why did he divide that space between the two rows of buildings with a, a channel? Just like he does here, 
on this gravestone, you know, uh, uh, Scarpa. So, um, you know, by the way, of Luis Khan and Carlos Scarpa, and they were friends. And I hope I have here a picture with both of them. Um, uh, Luis Khan said that uh, the adoration of the of of, uh, of the joint is actually the adoration of nature. Yes, and uh, bringing Frank Lloyd Wright into the discussion, by extension, is the adoration of God. Because when uh, Frank Lloyd Wright was asked in an interview, do you believe in God? And he said, I do, but I spell it nature. So the adoration of nature could be translated into the adoration of God. Another tomba, Udine, 1960. Uh, this is a drawing, but it's hard to, hard to read. Anyway, here it is. His piece, I don't know if he did the other one as well, probably not, only this one. But I like this, uh, I don't think it was his work, maybe. But maybe he agreed to leave it like this, this, uh, you know, so-called uh, ugly imperfection of, you know, deterioration of the world. Now I think it adds to the beauty of the, of, of the, of the work that, that Scarpa did. And again, here we see Tunis, and again we see the rift between two parts and so on, yes. Uh, alas, two souls are dwelling in my heart, as Faust said uh, through, or as Goethe said through Faust. Tomba Veriti, in Udine, again, this is a more uh, uh, ambitious work in a way because it's, uh, it's more than just a tombstone. Uh, I probably could attempt to write a, you know, a rather, satisfactory PhD paper on, on, on Carlos Scarpa, at least, you know, based on the quantity of research I did. Now I'm joking, of course, but um, uh, I enjoyed it. I, I, I is an architect to, to discover and uh, there is always something that you don't know. You know, it's, it's, um, it's always something uh, a little bit uh, off, a little bit strange and uh, And I, I really hope I have that picture with Luis Kahn and Carlos Scarpa. Now, if this doesn't fill your heart with joy, I don't know what, if you are a student of architecture. You know, here you have two great architects together. You know, you can tell that there is friendship between them and understanding. You know, after all, Luis Kahn wrote the, you know, the, the foreword or the introduction to a book uh, on the work of Carlos Scarpa. And of course, they recognized each other, each other's genius, you know, and and you, when you have, you know, two for the price of one is even better. I hope I have that picture. But until we arrive there, uh, look at the look at the awkwardness of this uh, gate. But the gate itself, as a program in architecture, is uh, is uh, a sumum of uh, of uh, challenges. No, because a gate, what is a gate? You know, it's a transition, it's a threshold, it's a separation and also uh, unifying uh, and also unifying at the same time. And he was attracted by this, by this theme, by this, the two-ness of a threshold, of a gate, both uh, belonging to the inside and the outside. You know, Bogdan, who I hope is still here, said that he is buried, you know, yes, I know vertically, but, uh, you know, uh, on the wall of the Brion Cemetery, but outside of actually of the Brion Cemetery. Again, it's about being on uh, be, being at the frontier, at the frontier between the inside and the outside. And, and, and uh, this uh, difficult uh, space of transition, I think is, is, is very, very fruitful for architecture and maybe not only for architecture. Uh, Tomba Capo Villa, Venezia. Uh, 
Yeah, this one is a little, I don't know, maybe he was asked to incorporate, uh, you know, a figurative uh, base relief here, I don't know. But here again, we see, we see the triumph of the third element here very well could have been a bird by Brancusi. Uh, in the middle, in the empty space between two entities, two you know solid parts. Maybe something wrong with me, but I I, I see I see arrows here too, and it's very interesting how this thing emerges in between the two. And then it has a platform or a base or a, I don't know how to call it, a uh, 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 Romanian or Taba, on which, what is that? Is like uh, 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 giving, like, uh, 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 yes, uh, uh, Otava, God, how could I say this in English? Uh, uh, for, uh, with offerings for the gods, for the sky, for God. It, it, it's, 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 uh, you know, some kind of a uh, homage in a way to, to, to the above. Very nice. Basamento de la Cultura. This one is right uh, across the, um, I don't know how to call it. Um, it's uh, where the Venice Biennial uh, is. And many people pass by without knowing that there you have also a very good uh, sculptural work by Augusto Murer, but also the base is made by Carlos Scarpa. And it's here. I mean, it's splendid, it's beautiful. I mean, Venice is beautiful. The sunset in, in Venice is beautiful. Uh, uh, the, everything is beautiful. Uh, this sculpture is beautiful. The canal is beautiful. And these, these cubes are done by uh, Carlos Scarpa. Uh, when did he do them? 1968. Basamento de la Scultura La Partigiana, the Augusto Murel, 1968. Um, to me, these are little, I mean, a question, uh, it's a question of taste, but uh, I wish these were not so white and so clean. I wish they were more darkened by water, but maybe when, when the level of the sea, of the, of the water uh, grows, I don't know, actually, they almost exasperate me with their cleanness and newness. Maybe, I don't know, maybe something wrong there. But here, where also you have, uh, you know, the, the nature activate the stone, interact with the stone, it's, it's nice. And it's, you know, and the, and the, and the sculpture is magnificent. You know, it's, ah, this is art. This is art, that is his feeling, his emotion, his spirit. His spirit, this is what it is, a word we do not use most of the time, and it's sad. Um, yes, it's about uh, paying homage, it's about death, it's about commemoration. But we are all to be commemorated one day. We, we are born in order to die. And so in such, acts of, of paying homage, we connect with those who preceded us and with those who will come after us. Again, the threshold, the existential uh, threshold and the existential hourglass, you know, where the past becomes present and becomes future and the future becomes past and death nourishes life and life nourishes death. I love the sculpture, it's true. <clears throat> anyway, let's not become too emotional. Let's uh, allow the, the geometry of Carlos Scarpa because he is using here geometry. Yes, it is uh, playing with cubes, but um, there are cubes, all right. Uh, and then uh, look at this glorious black and white picture of the same thing. It's, if I am to speculate philosophically, to attempt to speculate philosophically, looking at this picture, why do I see? Well, I see this rather solid 
stubborn cubes that slowly disintegrate, they slowly disperse themselves towards what matters actually, you know, the, uh, the reminder, the reminder that the sculpture does. And, and, and this is actually, they lead to, in a way they are horizontal pedestals. They lead towards the artwork. The artwork doesn't sit on, on top of them, like usually a sculpture sits on a pedestal, but they lead, it's the transition between the, be, between, uh, uh, you know, the, the earth in a way, the telluric towards the, if I can call it so, but it, it, it's a little bit maybe rhetorical, the celestiousness, if there is such a word of the sculpture. Uh, so this is a transition, a transition from the walking alley here and the Venice Biennial campus is right across the space from here. And, and this, you know, reminder of the fragility of life and the unfairness of war, because it's, it's probably commemorating something having to do with this. Now we arrive at uh, his masterpiece, perhaps his best known work, uh, Tomba Brion in San Vito dal Tivole, 1974-1978, when he died, he died in 1978 under curious circumstances, falling from a building in Japan, in his beloved Japan, or on a stair in Japan, or a, I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't find very precise information. There are various uh, stories about it. Um, it's for a family, it's a private cemetery. It's not uh, what we are accustomed to, but uh, it's, it's an aristocratic work. You know, it's, it's, I mean, who could afford, you know, a private cemetery? Well, that's what it is. And it's a reflection, a meditation again on life and death. And life and death are the two cups of the hourglass or clepsydra of existence. And uh, that's why when we talk about life, I think we should also reflect on uh, its uh, other side, so to speak. That's why um, uh, Cesare Zavattini, an important uh, uh, film, uh, well, screenplay writer, uh, uh, said that, that if he had the power, he would have reminded everyone in the world that one day they would die. And uh, he didn't have this thought because of mor morbidity. The same way Ingmar Berman said that mo not one single day in his life he spent without thinking about death. And he was not morbid. Uh, he was highly creative. Maybe that knowledge uh, made him uh, even in intensified his, um, uh, his creativity. Uh, this is the plan. I, uh, I'm not, I, I, I mean, there were books written about this uh, formidable work. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's really one of the most uh, uh, complex, accomplished, uh, enigmatic, poetical, architectural works ever made. And maybe it's not an accident that, that it, it is actually uh, a domus eterna. It's, 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 it's a cemetery. Concrete. Of course, uh, he didn't think about the fact that concrete pollutes, uh, uh, but uh, what am I to say here that is not a uh, loss of uh, words? or of your time, I don't know. I don't know, again, it is uh, concrete, it is water, there is dirt, if we are to call it dirt, the aging of the concrete under the, you know, the, the, the pressure of the elements. Uh, when I wrote about this building, I, I noticed this, but this is not just about this building, the erosions. I call actually the works of, uh, of uh, Carlos Scarpa as being positive erosions. I know it's oxymoronic what I said, because an or, or erosion usually you would consider in, in, uh, in negative terms. 
it's a subtraction, but these are positive subtractions. They are positive erosions, uh, if that makes sense. Uh, and, and then, I mean, you know, I mean, look, here is an erosion, another positive erosion. You know, why did he do it? The functionalist would not understand. But the functionalist doesn't understand what architecture is. That's why I, I'm totally against the simplistic functionalism that we practice stub stubbornly. Um, not that functionalism could not have some positive values itself. It could. And there are some good fun so-called functionalist buildings. But I still think that uh, the best functionalist buildings are those that uh, somewhere, somehow, you know, they turn at least temporarily or slightly their back on functionalism. Like this, like this gate, another gate. You know, who would do such a gate? You know, it's it's almost like a wall. It's a wall which which moves, but it's I don't know if I'm inspired enough now and knowledgeable enough to uh, uh, to express. I can tell you when I visited it the first time. I think only two times I visited it. But the first time was with two young. Uh, I don't know if they were architects or students in architecture from Australia. And there were just the three of us in this cemetery. And I talked a little bit to, of them with them. They came from Australia to visit this cemetery, specifically for this cemetery. You see the power of art, of true art and true architecture. It attracts people from very far away who are not tiring to take the plane for many hours to come to see the work. And I think if we have any ambition in us in the good sense of the word, we should struggle to do work so good that two or three or five or one Australians would love to take the plane just to see the work, just as Stephen Hall wrote to me that he would love to come to Tergujiu to see the endless column by Brancusch. Him not being a student in architecture or a young uh, Australian architect, but a 74 years old man. And still he wanted to learn and to see a significant work. And August, Stefan Augustin Doinaș, the Romanian poet, was correct when he said, only what is a wonder deserves to be. And if we keep infesting the world, with works which are not worthy of being, we are destroying not only the earth, we are also destroying ourselves and destroying life. So attempt to do significant works. Just when you make a project that, especially if it is to be built, do it in such a way that one day, hopefully, two, let's say two young Australians will take the plane to come to see it. Not easy, I, I recognize, it's not easy, but, uh, but this is the challenge and the beauty of, of creating anything. Look at this, the ziggurats which play hide and seek, as I said, with each other. It's, what are these things here? They are, they are well, they have a, you know, they are like the, the peacock's tail, you know, they are useless. Certainly useless in, in terms of, uh, of uh, an explicit uh, down to earth, so to speak, function, but they have an allegorical, a metaphorical, <clears throat> a symbolic meaning. You know, they are they show progressions and regressions. They show the dynamics of life. You know, everything that is alive is uh, emerging, is uh, evolving, is is subtracting, is adding and subtracting at the same time. You have continuously two forces at play and continuously the dialectics between them. Concrete, the truth is, uh, never mind, it pollutes, but uh, it can be very beautiful when, especially when it is uh, stained, you know, uh, it's, it's, um, it's, it's lovely. 
it's lovely. Don't we see here the two circles that I kept mentioning? And yes, he was himself obsessed with saw them or we saw them in his drawings. And here we see the, the positive erosions. Of course, this work is in good measure sculpture, but between architecture and sculpture, there is a love story. Uh, architecture, unfortunately, kind of forget uh, its lover, its former lover, that is sculpture. Too bad. Too bad for the many talented sculptors who are not invited to contribute to the buildings, our buildings. And then there is the water, of course, which is a luxury. But uh, when you have the stone, well, even in its artificial form, the concrete, and you have water, then something magical happens. Because I talked about Lao Tzu, no? uh, who praised water for the, the incredible strength of water. The building is supposed to be symbolically stone. It is stone, that it is concrete or whatever, but it's stone. And the water, the fragile water, problematizes that stone. So it's 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 the dialogue, in a way, a building, any building, even the so-called our demagogical green buildings are in their essence red. Red, not green, even if their color is gray or green. They are red in their essence, conceptual uh, or whatever. And they are fire, in other words, because it's the fire of the imagination of the creator, is the fire that creates uh, metal, is the fire of the of the metal inside the uh, concrete is the fire that is used to create even to make even glass it's without fire we could not have built any building any building in its essence is red including so called uh, simplistically and misleadingly and demagogically called green architecture that is red too and then we have the green in fact the greenness belongs to the water so we have fire and water. The building is fire and the water is water. So we have fire and water. Well, we have alchemy. That's what we have. And the Chinese who know something about this, they employ water all the time around the well, more or less inspired buildings in the present. They, they continuously employ, bring water in, 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 in very close proximity to their buildings and they do well. Of course, they have the money to do it, but why do they have the money? Because they deserve it. They work hard, very, very hard. And uh, what would the uh, world economy do without them? Um, and look, look at this strange thing here. There's, uh, what is this here? You know, it's, uh, it's cryptical, you know, it's a, uh, it's a logo of some sort, or I, 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 probably the word logo is too, too banal, too prosaic. I don't know what it is, but uh, you know, there is a fourness here, and there is a two-ness here, and there is, there is some kind of a cross, but it's not really a cross with curved parts. I don't know what it is, but he planted it there in the concrete for some reason. Now here there are references to oriental architecture. And we know that Carlos Scarpa was very, uh, not only very knowledgeable about oriental architecture, but he was also um, uh, very uh, inspired by it, the spirit of oriental architecture. It's a continuous uh, 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 dialogue and conflict between uh, stability and instability, between solidity and fragility. And that's what life is uh, for all of us. It's a building which is both audacious and modest. And this is very, very difficult to do. It's very easy to be, you know, inflated, to have a, you know, bombastic chest, and make a bombastic building, like some building by Sir Norman Foster. Okay, so what? You are only celebrating the masculine principle, that's it. But there is also femininity. And uh, you know, there is fire and there is water. And if you have just one, it's not enough. 
look at look, look at this diagonal here you know uh, again uh, you remember earlier we saw a picture of that uh, i don't know what it was a chimney of some sort or also with a cut a cut that cut that cut is art you know that 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 cut is worth all the money you know it's just, just this thing you know forget the whole thing is this cut here why did he make it did he have to make it no no he didn't have to but it's 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 um, it's great art in my opinion and look how look how the work of scarpa welcomes the wild nature you know that the nature the nature wants to make love to the architecture of carlos scarpa that's what we see here an embrace between the two they 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 love each other you know and then paradoxically anyway let's not uh, i don't i'm not going to become too explicit here but uh, this conjunction between nature and the work of man and of course of course carlos scarpa would not have used the foolish words of winnie mass who is otherwise a good architect the main designer at mdrdv who said uh, use the words uh, about one of the projects to our smart nature <laughs> i mean this is ridiculous i i i think i might even said it once uh, this very evening to our smart nature well carlos scarpa doesn't want to outsmart nature nature and he knows how you cannot outsmart nature even if you try hard you can't and you know coming via frank Lloyd Wright that nature is god uh, saying that you outsmart nature coincides with saying outsmarting god this is ridiculous <laughs> you know i mean really ridiculous and look at look at these two tombs you know again two nests a couple they 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 are uh, you know oriented towards each other a little bit they are distinct also the base you know is, uh, is suggesting instability because it's a little bit curved here so you would say this could this could actually fall you know if pushed a little bit and 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 uh, you know they it, it's beautiful it's really beautiful because you have probably the, the that's what we look at here the two tombs you know longing for each other almost arriving at each other but not quite and um, i'm speechless i'm speechless and here we see the erosion of man i mean the positive erosion is not the erosion provoked by nature is an erosion pro consciously provoked by the artist the architect the author he erodes his own structure because he's aware he's anticipating the work of time and the work of nature Now, Joseph Brodsky, the, the youngest, I don't know if he's still, probably still the youngest uh, poet who received the Nobel Prize in Poetry, a Russian, Joseph Brodsky, although he was born in Russia and lived in the United States, he chose to be buried in Venice. And, uh, you know, I just, I just, I just had this uh, <clears throat> uh, maybe inadequate and uh, uh, yeah inadequate thought of that if i die and of course i will die i would love to be buried here in this cemetery which of course will not happen even the the author of the cemetery was not allowed to 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 enter it so he was kept at the edge on the fringe um it is a beautiful uh, architectural work what else can we say you know it's it transcends time space ideologies uh, religious denominations it's really a, a meditation on 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 everything in a way you know it's uh, when you see such a work you know you don't ask the stupid questions you know how am i to bring the piano in or the refrigerator in or you know where is the toilet or the or the parking or such ridiculous things you know there is more to life than these things really
look here again, the two, the pairs continuously, you know, in love with each other. They are everywhere, you know, it's, they're everywhere. Uh, here too, and also those two big circles that we saw uh, from, uh, from uh, this is a, like a, a chapel. Uh, look here, look here. Le Corbusier and Yanis Xenakis and at their intersection springs Ronchamp, as we saw in a diagram that I discovered on the web when I present, when we paid homage to Yanis Xenakis. And this year is his centennial. Stelle commemorativa del secondo anniversario della strage di Piazza della Loggia Brescia, 1977. This, I think, uh, I hate this. I really hate these pictures cut in half by the by the by this uh, photographer or this organization. Uh, I don't know. I, he only did this. I think this thing uh, is not perhaps worth uh, worthy of. Uh, but this is a recent photograph because you see, or maybe that uh, that masking he has nothing to do with the pandemic. But I think it does. Uh, he does because everybody wears them. Um, it's, yeah, he only did this thing here. Um, I don't know what they, it is exactly. He, he obviously liked to work for such uh, little programs, you know, like pedestals or whatever. But what moves me in this picture, and he really does, these people who are probably not artists, well, maybe one person is, but they are not. And, uh, you know, risking to get the virus, <laughs> You know, here they need to clean up this thing, uh, you know, uh, to, uh, to contribute to the, to, the, to, the, to the endurance of the work done by the compatriot uh, uh, um, Carlos Carpa. And uh, again, let's read this, it's a stella, it's a stella commemorative, the second, secondo anniversario della strage di piazza. I don't know, yes, it's some kind of a commemorative uh, thing that he built. And, uh, but, so again, these people came here just to, to clean it up, restore it after they gathered the funds and so on. So what does this show? It shows that the good work in a way is never alone or it shouldn't be alone. In, in other people, you know, contribute, even though we don't know their names, they contribute to the lasting of the work, and this is beautiful. And these are, uh, I don't know, the, the, the drawings that do not really seem to be made by uh, Carlos Scarpa, but uh, the way, imagine, he was, he designed this thing uh, in this way. And uh, yeah, you would say it's a small work, but uh, small works are important too. And, uh, and look here, this is Scarpa again, it's, it's it's unbelievable, actually. I mean, these small things, you know, that um, it's very very possible you pass by them. Look, the the two ziggurats, the two parts are even in this smallest detail here. Uh, and uh, let's see if I have another picture. Uh, yeah, it's it's just the the handrail that separates the the you know the this stella uh, from the street or square, whatever it is. So he did this thing, but this thing itself, it's magical because it's archi architectural. You know, it's made as uh, fragments, uh, uh, you know, that add up to the length uh, required. Also the vertical element is again, you can make architecture and you should for the smallest thing, you know, the smallest thing, you know, just a, just a handrail. I have to look at this again. And unfortunately I cannot see very well especially with my glasses, which I buy, buy in a flea market with five lei uh, or five ron. Um, and of course they are not made for my, I, I, I ruin my eyes in this way, but uh, on the other hand, <clears throat> I have the chance to see the world through other people's eyes, which is a great chance. Uh, look at these small pieces, they really intrigue me. You know, this thing, you know, uh, uh, Yeah, you could say become obsessional. It's probably true. So let's go to another tomb. Gali Genova, Realizzazione Postuma, 
1981. We know he died in 1978. Uh, and again, we see the rift and we see the two parts. Uh, uh, but it's an interesting work, vigorous, and because of its uh, textures, um, tectonically is, uh, is, is vigorous. Uh, although, I, although it shouldn't be too vigorous because it is a tomb after all, but it's not too vigorous, it's just fine. Museums, Biennale di Venezia, Padiglione del Libro, the, the, the pavilion of, of books, Venice, 1950. And still, this one is uh, still an amazing structure. I don't know if it still exists because I, 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 was, I was a few times there and I, I never saw it. It's, uh, there must be something wrong with me. I saw the one built by uh, Alvar Alto, but I didn't see this one. This is more uh, kind of in, a, in town with the Venice Biennial because it's, uh, you know, it's, um, you know, more outgoing and, uh, you know, in a way modernistic and, uh, you know, it's not, uh, it's not a nostalgic structure. You know, the Venice Biennial is not about nostalgia. Although Rem has tried to bring nostalgia in when he was uh, exploring foundations. Uh, but he, uh, Rem Kolhas uh, is a dubious figure in my opinion. He can only be trusted so far. This is a model of this pavilion that he uh, built for uh, the Venice Biennial. Interesting this one too. And uh, I'm not sure I quite understand it. But uh, also a little bit aggressive, which is not very common from him uh, to see aggressive architecture. But this is a little bit, particularly the triangular uh, elements. Uh, this drawing does not belong to him. Uh, it's a computerized drawing. I don't know if it still exists. It's possible it doesn't. Then the billetteria. Bil Militeria is where, you know, a kiosk for selling uh, tickets at the Venice Biennial in Giardini di Castello. Um, here it is. Didn't we talk about Tunis? Here they are again. He, this man cannot just do a, a monolith without attempting at least to cut it in two. He cut it in two, this one as well. Uh, rather strange. You know, I, I, I'm not even sure if I, if I could say I like it. But it does have personality, and it's 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 unique. It's uh, idiosyncratic, and it's just uh, for selling tickets, you know. But but why not make something special if you can? And he did. And again, we see the column in the case of Carlos Carpa, the the adoration of the joint here when it approaches the concrete, um, you know, uh, slab. There is a transitional element, so there is another one here, here also between the vertical and the horizontal. It's always a sum of, uh, of tensions and uh, negotiations. I keep coming back to this work for some reason. Galleria d'Arte Moderna, Il Cavallino in Venezia, no pictures. This is a this Sistemazione delle Galleria dell'Accademia in Venezia, 1952-1955. A great uh, art gallery there, but no pictures. Giardino della Sculture, Venezia, the, uh, the Garden of Sculpture. Uh, this exists uh, in, uh, in, in, uh, in the campus of the Venice Biennial. We see here another kind of tunes between convexity and concavity. Although they are both convexities, but it depends how you look at it, uh, but they are opposing each other. And so it's again about the dialectics and conflict and conjunction and disjunction at the same time. This is also cut in two. Uh, a student of architecture is possible or an architect, an admirer perhaps of, uh, of um, Carlos Scarpa. Now, was this done by him like this intentionally? It's possible because, because again, the tunes, but uh, this is also interesting, you know, just this wall, you know, unfinished as it is, and it didn't have to be finished. 
I like it. I love it. Uh, and water, again, water. Uh, and then the massive, uh, you know, was it necessary to be so massive? Probably not. But uh, he, he did it. Uh, he has it too. But, but again, uh, you know, the horizontal slab, the slab is not uh, uh, sitting on this massive uh, vertical support uh, directly, but through the, you know, an intermediate element. And we know this. And again and again is the adoration of the joint. And through that joint, nature enters lovingly and uh, triumphantly because nature has good taste that's what it is gypsoteca canoviana in treviso uh, he, because he he was very very knowledgeable about how to do interior design he had various commissions in this field you know look at these um, windows here you know which uh, the, would exasperate the functionalist but uh, I hope I had, I had another picture. Well, the kind of here, but again, we see here the same thing. This also is some kind of a positive erosion because you know, I almost said normally, most architects would have just uh, had this wall meet the other wall at the corner. But uh, you know, he, so the corner of the space would be, uh, uh, centrifugal, and then he introduces a configuration that is uh, um, a centripetal or vice versa. It's, it's um, I don't know if I explained well. Geometrically, this is a convexity, convexity, and here, geometrically, this is a concavity. So he uh, brings in the concavity, the geometrical concavity, exactly at the corner, and thus he anticipates because the corner in many important architectures, in, in any architecture actually, is the most uh, vulnerable part of the building actually, the corner. And uh, important architects from Miss van der Rohe and even uh, Palladio uh, had a lot of attention for the corner. And again, in the corner, he, uh, he brings additional fragility the corner existentially is fragile, but 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 uh, Carlos Scarpa amplifies the fragility by by cutting the corner in this way and 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 bringing the windows, but in a very unusual way because of course we have many examples of uh, you know the window turn, turning around the corner, eliminating the corner so to speak in Frank Lloyd Wright and other architectures. But what he did he does here is is, is different. Is different. He's, he doesn't just play with a with a window that uh, uh, you know transgresses uh, <clears throat> the corner. Uh, he creates two windows that are almost facing each other. Well, at, at an angle, a ninety degrees angle. It's very interesting. Uh, and uh, I wish I had other pictures. Maybe I do. You see the interior. You know, it's um, so. You know. He, he, he creates something th three-dimensional in this corner, although it would have been there very easily, um, you know, uh, very easily possible to remain within the field of two dimensions. I don't know if I, uh, my wording is, uh, is, is the best, but I think you understand even without my words quite well. Uh, because what we look at here from the outside we look at here from the inside. That's what it is. And then look at this window here, <laughs> because here is a, in a way a triple corner. I mean, I am saying stupidities now, but. What I'm trying to say is that not only two walls meet, but they also meet at the top of the building <coughs> with a with a with a slab, the terrace. So he he uh, sub he he subversive towards the very corner of the building at the very top. You remember probably in that formidable building by Louis Sullivan when where, where he 
uh, emphasize that special point uh, or, or, or zone of the building by 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 uh, by a tree like uh, you know uh, ornamental uh, uh, configuration that dramatizes the corner. Here we don't have ornament per se, but we have this uh, cube of light because how else are we to name it, which is not simplistically uh, you know done. I mean, look even here, even even here in the corner of the cube of light, there are interesting things happening, studied that is. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the, this, this thing itself, this co, uh, you know, this cube of light, we could perhaps, you know, see if we are poetically inclined and rather exalted as an homage to God and as an homage to light, as an homage to cosmos, as an homage to, uh, anything that is, uh, you know, uplifting and, uh, you know, flying, flying, yes. Very nice, you know. Um, now, would uh, rainwater penetrate the cube of light inside the building? Well, that, that might be possible, but uh, Italians can be very good uh, builders and craftsmen. And uh, plus, if that does happen, maybe, maybe inspired by Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, Carlos Scarpa, if he was alive, he would have told the manager or the people who administered the building to just put a pot underneath this uh, transparent uh, cube of light. Museo Correr, Venezia, this is another mother, mother, masterwork. 1952, 1953, and then 1957, 1969. Uh, but um, we don't have now. I, I, it was sorry, it was my mistake. I was too exalted. I was referring to this one, the Museo Civico di Castelvecchio in Verona. Uh, difficult, difficult work to interpret unless you visited it, and I didn't visit it. Uh, in Castel Vecchio, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. It does seem so, but uh, let's see in what way. You know, he was dealing with an existing building and uh, he was inserting, he was very good at this, where he was, he was handling situations where already there was a past, where already there is a present or that there was something there. Just like in the case of the ballad, of Master Manole, who started to build his church not in an you know in a on, on you know on a um, you know free land, but if you remember the ballad, he said to his workers, the place to start building the church was there where a dog was barking and there was a ruin. This is not. This is not accidental and it's not without importance. The anonymous author of the ballad of Master Manole had the intuition that the building, in order to legitimate its coming into being, needs some kind of rooting, some kind of past, the proximity uh, of, of, uh, of, of uh, in other words, to situate itself on the spiral, on, on, on some kind of a, spiral connected with, with, with what preceded it and with what might come. And what is the barking of the dog? What does it mean? Because that's what in the uh, ballad of Master Manole it is said, it is written that, that only when Manole heard the dog barking and he saw a ruin in his search for a place where to build his, his church, only then he said to his workers, let's stop. We build the church here. This is the place. But, but what does the dog mean? The dog is known in mythology as being the one who accompanies man or the human being in the beyond, in death, in Hades, in, the, in, 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 yeah, in death. So a barking dog could mean you know, that the, the dog, it's known. I even read recently that a dog somewhere, I forgot where, uh, lived uh, near the grave of his uh, so-called master, well, his friend, 
his human friend for many days without eating anything, just being there, because dogs are very, very loyal. So a barking log, a dog uh, could uh, evoke, you know, the presence of death, but also the presence of a past life, just like the ruin. So coming back to Carlos Scarpa, I think Carlos Scarpa also uh, metaphorically or factually would have loved to build and did build there where a dog barked and where there was a ruin. And here there was a ruin. We see a, a ruin park here. We see fragments of ruin here. Uh, this was an old building and he just inserted new interventions which are, uh, uh, you know, I, I mean, I don't know if I do justice to this building, improvising now, more or less uh, inspired, uh, uh, but, um, you know, it's, 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 it's really about, uh, about asserting one's time, but also continuing, connecting, connecting with what uh, preceded him. Um, sorry about that blank uh, slide, I don't know what happened. So again, the building existed. The part that he worked on was here and also the inside. Now you see this part here is, a, is a, you almost don't notice it. You look at this courtyard and the garden and so on. And you almost don't notice that there is an intervention here that belongs to our time. But it's not, it's not aggressively belonging to our time. It's, it's again, some kind of a positive erosion. It's, it's an intervention, uh, but, uh, but, but it's, uh, uh, it's not uh, in a disruptive way divorced from the, the existing. It's, it's, it's rather, you know, well, it's, it's both discreetly and audaciously present. And he has such interventions all the time. Uh, in his architecture, you know, some more noticeable than others. Like here, you know, this uh, this is the work of Carlos Carpa. But uh, you know, uh, yes, it is it is different from uh, the rest of the building, but not in a you know uh, alarming way. Although it is distinctly him. He did work with uh, with squares. We know we have seen it even at the Venice Biennial. Um, I am a little bit tired, but we'll continue. We have a few more slides to show. Uh, I do have a lot, uh, uh, I had about 400 uh, images with his work and sorry for, uh, for uh, this long presentation. Um, Look at this, it, it's, it's <laughs> really, I think it's very beautiful because it's clearly a, a con so-called contemporary or a modern intervention, but it, it transcends somehow, you know, fashion, time even, although we feel its modernity. And, and it, it, it continues to be some kind of a ruin, but an, an, uh, uh, I don't know how to say, a wilt ruin. This is a wilt ruin. Um, um, you know, uh, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's desired and provoked and designed by the architect, but not literally as a ruin. And this is the difficult thing to do without mimicking the ruin. He's still evoking the fragmentation, which the ruin means. And then there is, of course, the, the, the disobedience of diagonal and diagonals are always very good at this. And then the interplay of light and shadow, which is, uh, you know, uh, distinctive, good work, excellent work. He probably created also these easels you know, uh, we, which in itself is a, is a, is a, you know, is a creation.
Now, the professor of interior design or interior architecture, of course, was at home with such programs. Biennale di Venezia, Padiglione del Venezuela. He designed the pavilion of Venezuela. Is this one where, again, the windows are, uh, you know, uh, events in themselves, as they should be if we could, uh, if we could do so. Venezuela. Designed by Carlos Carpa, the non-architect. <laughs> yeah. Or maybe man didn't make him a, an architect, but God did. And uh, look at this. Yeah, it's a creation right here, which welcomes uh, because I don't think he, I don't think, but I could be wrong. No, I don't think. I don't think I'm wrong. I, I don't think this, uh, you know, this imperfect edge here was done by him intentionally. But who knows? But I don't think it was. Anyway, it was or it wasn't. But uh, everything in these small things which you step on and you move on and you don't, you almost do not notice. But uh, get a clo uh, close uh, look, um, it's hard not to notice. Also, what's interesting, you know, because the door, I imagine, I mean, maybe if you, I don't know. No, I think it was done intentionally. So, so you know, you don't go straight. You go, you know, if you walk here and you are inclined to, to, to walk here on this side, the left side of, the, of this, uh, you are, you, what I'm trying to say is the, the, the access is a little bit uh, made, it's made a little bit difficult, you know, because you go zigzagging, you go like this and then you turn right and enter. And this is also happening in uh, at Villa Mairea by Alvaralto and in other uh, buildings by uh, Alvaralto, it was uh, said that um, the entrance is not direct, it's not straight. It's not a straight line, you know, from A to B. And it's the same thing here, you know? And again, the functional is to breathe hard. The functional is to say, wait a minute, uh, you know, I'm hitting a, a wall here, or, uh, you know, I, the, the door is here. Let's move these things to the right, so go straight. No, no, the architect who is a poet knows better. Sorry to the functionalist. I'm reminded, and I, I, I mentioned this before, Fernando Pessoa, who was in love with, a, with a, an employee, a colleague, of, a colleague in the same office. And he, you know, he, he designed, he drew, you know, the longest way to, go, to accompany her home. You know, the longest is the same thing here in a way. You know, it's not the longest, but it is a little bit of a postponement. You know, it's not a direct, you know, straight and efficient and so on. No, it's, it's, a, it's a, a little postponement. He's the, the architect of postponements, I would say. Not the only one, but he is. Venezuela, Venezuela, the pavilion. Well, the artwork is not his. Anyway, the glory of art, Palazzo Abateris, Galleria Regionale di Sicilia, Palermo. No pictures. Progetto per il Museo Picasso in Parigi, 1976. He was uh, 70 years old, but do I have pictures now? Sorry, I couldn't find pictures for those now. Public buildings, as if the others, well, some of them were public. Fondazione Querini Stampalia in Venezia, an important work by film, 1961-1963. God, I'm afraid it will be midnight when we finish this. Uh, commemorative uh, presentation. Look here again, talking about zigzagging and postponing. Well, these stairs, you know, uh, they are also not straight. They are going a little bit, you know, uh, uh, on the side, so to speak, or, you know, there is a twist here. And what is the role of this uh, stair? Of course, the level of the water of the canal grows uh, and, and, and he welcomes the, the water even inside the building. I don't think these stairs are used for access into the building. 
I don't know. Are they just to, you know, maybe to sit here and contemplate the water or uh, symbolically representing some kind of a dialogue between the building, the upper part and, and, and uh, you know, the exterior and also the, the, the water of the canal. Uh, I should read more about this, but uh, it's, 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 it's a good work. And there is also, uh, we, we are going to see the bridge also a magnificent work. This idea, this, which is also oriental, instead of building a fortress wall in front of the water, to actually, just like in uh, oriental philosophy, welcome the adversity, of, if we are to call it so, of uh, the incoming water, and uh, not oppose it, but uh, receive it in a certain way. How exactly is that certain way? Look at these inc incisions here. You know, uh, why did I do, why did he do them? Well, they are decorative, I mean, ornamental, but in a superior sense. Anyway, and this is the bridge again and again, the conjunction of two elements through adoring the joint again and again, the two parts, you know, connecting and then, uh, you know, they are separated, they unite, and then they separate again, as you can see. So separation, conjunction, separation, conjunction. is really, I, I cannot avoid the word, it's eros, it's the tango of love. And here again, two, two parts, two parts, and uh, magically done. I mean, the craftsmanship is superior, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, you can write an hymn to beauty and to architecture just by contemplating this edge of the handrail. That's it. Uh, I mean, uh, we didn't yet finish the presentation, unfortunately, for both you and me. Um, again and again and again, the two interlocking, uh, meeting halfway, water, water coming in, it's okay, the, the rift, the cut showing the two-ness of life, the two-ness of life again, aspiration, longing, longing for each other, even is even as cuts. <laughs> this is also magical here. You know, the erosion of this, I mean, most architects you would have not even given a thought to it, you know, but look what he does here. Uh, I mean, countless books had been uh, published just with the details of his work, but in a way, all his work is, is details. <laughs> if it is true that in architecture, there are no details, in the architecture of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of Carlos Carpa, there are only details, but details which are supreme architecture in, in the uh, very essence. I don't know what's going on here. The garden, yes, the garden. Uh, at the level of the eye, perhaps, you know, this uh, ornamental uh, decorative uh, insertion in the, in the thickness of the concrete wall, but he uses ornament all the time, you know, in an abstracted way, but he does. And then again, he was a, ma he was a master of, uh, of channeling water, as we remember, uh, you know, from one place to another. Even, even this is magnificent. I remember when I visited Alhambra, I fell in love with the way the Arabs were doing the garden. In fact, I like more the garden than the, than the building, which itself is glorious. But the gardens, you know, I, I kept filming them for two hours. It was just the art of understanding water it's just amazing. So if you arrive at Alhambra, please, please pay attention to, uh, to those magnificent gardeners. Uh, here also, it's, it's, it's art, you know, it's, it's art, it's architecture, it's art, it's landscape architecture, it's, uh, it's even psychoanalysis. No, maybe not analysis, psychosynthesis. And look here. Really, let's not move forward. Let's stop at this image, you know, although I have other, other images, but let's stop here. Let's stop this presentation here.
let's erode it positively, the presentation. <laughs> this image, this image means more than everything I try to say and said. In fact, I will become silent now. Maybe we should never, not even say goodbye, not even say goodnight. Whoever wants to look at this, well, I will leave it here until midnight and probably for six more hours or four more hours, five more hours. Who wants to contemplate it for five more hours is welcome. I leave the, I leave the, I leave the Zoom on and maybe even myself, I'll just stay uh, here and stare at this because I think Of course, he complicated himself. You know, any other architect or designer would have, if, if, if he or she wanted to make a little fountain, would have done it very efficiently and very simply. But you almost see the conceptual and the metaphysical and the factual zigzagging of, of water, you know, going through these things. Are these postponements, which I think are magical? He postpones. You know, it's and by postponing, he reaches eternity. That's what it is. He reaches eternity. I stop here. Thank you.